Tetragrammaton. I think if you do a thing for a really long time, you can get into um, anything can be by rote. You know, you can get to the place where you're doing things kind of beautifully unconsciously. And then you can get to where you're maybe on autopilot and like the right kind of instinctive and unconscious is wonderful. And then there's that thing where I don't want to say phoning it in because I, I hope I've never done that. But um but where you're too familiar with a set of moves. And I, I definitely am approaching a place where I almost feel that I'm not really sure I remember what I'm supposed to do or how I'm supposed to approach it. And I'm kind of happy about that. But I think if I, if I kind of stand back from it all, I think that when it's working really well, you feel like you're channeling something through that. Yeah, you you might have, you know, just like a musician or anything, you've done the work to and the craft work to create the the conduits that you're accessing the channel through, but that you've tapped into something where you're not having to. Yeah, you're 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 letting something go through you. That's not that's not you. And I think I think at the center of it is empathy. I, I kind of think if an actor can't anchor themselves in real empathy, there's nothing really good. There might be performative kind of bullshit or, you know, comedy or humor or whatever. But for me, it's kind of like you got to get to a place where you you're trying to seek some sort of a deep, a deep understanding of a different person's experience and what flows out of it in interesting ways. But ultimately that's, I think that's empathy, you know? When you're in it, do you know you're in it? I think sometimes, sometimes be because the times that I know uh, that I felt really good, something unbidden is happening, something unplanned or um, really great film director and one of my real mentors in life, Milos Forman used to call it the unrepeatable moment. You know, the thing that even with all the cameras and even with, and all the artifice and the rehearsals, if there were some, or the fact that it's the fifth take or, or anything, that something happens that is just sort of unrepeatable and blooms not out of a conscious plan. And those things can be, you know, really delightful when, when they happen and make you feel like this is good. I think the other thing is that, uh, and this isn't in no way my own, you know, original observation, I think, but, but listening is really, really important because listening is just another word for, you know, being a, really genuinely available to what's going on. And um, I think many of my favorite actors, sometimes what I feel I'm riveted by is my awareness of their presence and absorption of what's going on, you know, stillness, listening, whatever you want to call it. But also if you're not listening with other actors, you're not really available to that unexpected thing. And so I think that's, I don't know if it's true in, in all things. I'm sure, you know, I've talked to our Anthony, about, you know, writing lyrics and coming in and performing them, even for friends of 30, 40 years, you feel self-conscious, you know? Mm -hmm. There's like self-consciousness in performance. And I think in acting, you, you fight self-consciousness or you have to try to cultivate space with other people where self-consciousness recedes so that you, you feel um, that you're not, you know, standing outside yourself and watching yourself you know, do something and reviewing it even as you're doing it. And I think that it's really interesting to me that, like I had an experience once with Robert De Niro of all people, right? The, a person we all came up on who, you know, he's certainly in the short list of 
reasons I became an actor, right? Or aspire or to do a certain type of work or whatever. And the first film, I did a couple of films with him, but the first film I worked with him on, I also was one of the writers on the script. And, um, and that was in some ways a bad thing because even though he was super complimentary of the work I had been doing, what it meant was that the first scene that I did with him in the film, which was a life ambition being realized, like I dreamed of working with him my whole young life, you know? Yeah. And it was there in front of me and he was there. And I knew he, he was very supportive of me in my early career and all these things. I knew he had nothing but good feeling toward me in life. But as we began the very first scene I ever worked on with him, I got this adrenalized feeling that, that he wasn't happy with what I was doing. And I, I got into this real moment of feeling hugely self-conscious. I went completely out. So, and my analytic brain was just going kapow, kapow, kapow. What's going on? Why, why isn't he, what, what's going on here? He seems really out of sorts with me or there's an energy coming, something. And we, we did it a few times. And then he kind of caught my eye and he looked at me and he gave me this look that was kind of like me going, yeah, seems like good. <laughs> it was a real check-in. It was like kind of real brotherly. Wow. And I was like, wait a minute. And I walked around the corner and I had, and this was like, I've made a lot of movies at this point. I wasn't new. I walked around the corner and I had this total epiphany, which was I realized that I was interacting with a videotape in my head of what he was gonna do in the scene because I had written it. And because I had an idea of what Robert De Niro's performance was gonna be like in the scene in my fantasy life, really, yeah. and in my writer's mind. And when in fact we were doing the scene and he was doing something, something else, I took it as a rebuke. Wow. My mind went, he's not showing up, he's resisting me, he's not doing this, why? And, and in a funny way, it was, it was funny because this, what I thought he was gonna do was in a scene of conflict, like yeah. rise to meet me yeah. with a certain energy, right? Yeah. And when he didn't, I actually took it in as a negative, uh, like a negative yeah, not, from the, him, right? The character didn't take it in, the, Ed took right. it in. I took it in. <laughs> and, but this is, I know this, this gets really down in the weeds, but it was an amazing moment for me because at this point, like, I'm I'm already a celebrated actor, right? Well, like I'm, you're, I'm someone you're in a scene with Robert De Niro, Robert so Niro. clearly right, you're right. a celebrated actor. At and this he'd point. asked me to be there. All these things, and I and I walked around the corner into the hall, and I had this like great self conversation, and I said, "You fucking idiot! You <laughs> idiot! You've dreamed about this moment your entire life. He's there in front of you." and you're not even available to what he's doing. You're not even listening to the actuality of what he's doing. You're interacting with a videotape in your head. And in fact, what he was doing was brilliant, which is just like me, my character was trying to get a rise out of him. And his creative choice was, no, no, I short circuit this young guy coming in with all his energy by not giving an actual, you know, fuck, I'm not getting, he's not going to rise out of me. And it was so brilliant. It was so much more true to, in a way, what a veteran person, a wiser person would do. Yeah. And the thing was, it was having the intended effect on me. He was putting me on tilt, right? Yeah. And when he gave me that look, I realized he's not, he's just doing the, he's actually doing what he does so well. And I literally said, Edward, turn your brain off and be, be where you always wanted to be with him. And it was a great moment for me because I realized like this, this never ends, you know, like it never ends. You can, your brain can mess you up badly in and take you out of, it can take you out of that presence of, and, and in the moment so fast 
because of self-consciousness, because of ego, really, at the end of the day, if, if I'm honest, it's just e your ego flares and says, like, I'm being, you know, all kinds of things, right? Was that the first time you were ever shook in a performance? Had it ever happened before where you just, based on what the other person was bringing, it took you out of yourself? I mean, I've certainly had, you know, the, the thing I love about doing theater as opposed to working in film is the, it's like concert work versus studio work. It, it's a Zen act, you know, it really is like a, a, you dip your brush in, in the ink and you try to stroke that character. And when it's done, it's gone. That's what we did tonight. Yeah. And it was a little more this or it was a little less that and someone might do something and when things are complex, I did, I did a play years ago with Catherine Keener that was, that was really hard. It's a wonderful play called Burn This by Lanford Wilson. And there's a line in the play about writing, but about creativity. And he, he says, one character says, you know, you got to make it personal, make it true, and then write Burn This on the cover. And I, I had it on the wall in my dressing room just because I thought that's what we're doing every night. Every single night, we, burn, we just got to burn it at the end and we did you know you did like you do a play for months and months and it was such a hard it was so hard the whole thing was so hard and it could you know careen around based on what you were feeling that night or whatever that i think like i'm not sure i ever felt we figured it out until really like the very end which is great you know but i found doing that that when you're doing live theater i i think like you can get i don't even say thrown off in a bad way you can be completely buffeted by, within the same text, you can, you can end up in a totally different place. Sometimes someone can forget a line, you know, they can drop a section and suddenly your, your brain is going, in one way it's going, what do we do now? What do we do now? What, does it matter, you know, that we drop that piece of text? What, how do we catch back up? You know, and it's, there's a lot of things can put you on tilt, but I had a really interesting experience once with, I think one of the great, my favorite filmmaker is Alejandro Iñárritu, who makes these unbelievably poetic films. Um, one time when we were doing Birdman, we were doing a scene that, that was really wonderful and hard, Michael Keaton and I, and, and we, we, we did it. And I think Michael Keaton and I looked at each other like, wow, that felt great, you know? That was, that was almost impossibly, See, and Alejandro came in and was just like ripping his hair out. He goes like, guys, 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 you know, I don't even remember what he said, but effectively he said, you just did white and I need black. Like that's how, <laughs> that's how far off, that's that's so how far funny. off you were. And Mike was a little thrown and I thought, I love Alejandro so much. Yeah. I think he's such a great artist. And I always, he was one of the, those kinds of people that I thought, I mean, I'm here in service to him. Yeah. Like, I, like, I love the way in your book, you talked about things being the best things are a diary entry. And why, why do you even care what other people think about your own diary? That's how, like, Birdman was Alejandro's diary entry. It was, every character was him. Keaton was him, I'm him. Emma Stone's character, the daughter is him. Everything being expressed in that film is a component of Alejandro's soul and character. And I think the whole film is a dialogue with himself about the different wrestling with his own ego and impulses and everything. And I knew going in, I am here to serve his diary. It's so good. I'm so interested in it. I'm interested in his process. And I, I was in the best possible place you can be, I think, as an actor with a director, which is complete surrender and complete trust. It's one of my favorite movies. It is. Absolutely. Yeah. It's yeah, a beautiful it's movie. Beautiful it's beautiful. It's a movie that made me, I remember when I saw it, I felt like, oh, this is a reason for there to be movies. Yes, I agree. That's how it made me feel. I agree. I agree. Because you, also because it is an, it's a meditation, um, you know, it's a meditation on aging and it's a meditation on ego and it's a meditation on aspiration to do work that matters in any way, in any field. And it's, it's creating stakes, emotional stakes out of like, you know, people wrestling with themselves. Yeah, but right? very Nothing or else. ordinary stuff. Like yeah. the stuff that was happening was ordinary, Yeah, but it comes up to this operatic level yeah. in the film. Yeah, and 
in a way, like I think one of the great, great, maybe the, maybe the original film. And when I say that, I mean, where I think a film that before it, there is no reference point for it is Fellini's Eight and a Half. That I think is kind of the first great modernist film in terms of being a meditation on self. It's a completely stream of consciousness, surreal meditation on creativity and ego and sex and love and everything. And I, I remember one time, I don't know Martin Scorsese super well at all. I've, I've met him in passing a few times, but one time I ended up at a table and everybody else kind of got up and I was just sitting there and he said, hello. I said, hello. I said, I have a weird question for you. I said, what's before eight and a half? And he goes, nothing, nothing. Wow. He goes, great question. Nothing, you know, <laughs> and I, and I, I think, and I think he's right. I think that's right because, and I think, Bert, you know, you can tie Birdman Day in half yeah. for sure. Yeah. You can tie, you can tie many other things. I think you can tie, like, if you take like Fellini's Amacord also, which just really memory of youth. I can name six films that flow from Amacord. I can't really name that many before Amacord that, that are that personal and structured just as memory of youth, you know? I think he really was an amazing innovator in terms of thinking that the medium of film can just be meditation and image and self and all these, not plot, but Alejandro's in that, he's that kind of a filmmaker. I think he tries to, he tries to take in the totality of the world and how it's refracting through people and it's never about plot. I think Birdman is really, really great. I think the one he did right before it called Beautiful. I don't know if you've ever seen that one. It's in Spanish. It's such a masterpiece of emotional life. Like I, it, it absolutely destroyed me. And I think um, when he came in on us and said, whatever you're doing, I need the opposite. I felt Michael kind of bristled a little. I, I was in such a good place that I went, I, I started laughing and I was like, I was like, that's the guy I want. Like yeah. that's, yeah. That that is whatever. If he says blue, yeah. I want to go blue. And what did it turn? Do you remember what it turned into versus how it started? This is what was really funny. So, it is really interesting thing, especially because that was quite a rehearsed film because of the technical necessities of doing super long choreographies and things like that. And so we're like, okay, so wait, you're saying just throw out everything we're doing and go, okay. And so so we started doing things that were just wildly different. And I thought in a funny way, it was a good, we got to some pretty interesting, maybe for me, not, not as um, connected or whatever, but after a while, Alejandro came back in just equally frustrated with his wild hair. And, t and he basically, in essence, he said, as though there had never been a previous thing, he was like, this is white and I need black. You know, he was basically saying, go back, go back to black, but without an acknowledgement, he never went, you know what? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that. It helped me see that I was wrong. And that the other was bad. He just, he was so caught up in it. Yeah. He said, no, it has to be this. He walked away and Chivo Lubetsky, the cinematographer who they've been friends since college. I, I kind of just shot him this look just to see if I, I, and he looked at me and he goes, he's, he's not talking to you. He's talking to himself. And I, and I was like, exactly, right. It, it's, it's, and, and sometimes um, in the best relationships, and you've been in so many of them, I think, but in the best relationships in creative work like that, you, that's allowed, you know, like someone, someone says, I need, I need to go, I need to know that you'll go a hundred percent with me into an experiment without begrudging it and without telling why it's wrong. And so that I can know that you gave me the full force of what you've got. So if it doesn't work, I have confidence that it doesn't work because it doesn't work. Not because you wouldn't fucking try it with me yeah. because you disagreed or because you whatever, right? And when you have, if you have that going on with people, you know, anything can happen. Like you can, you can get to that place where you go happily no, it, it, I, I thought maybe that, but not. So you've sort of like, you know, tried it out and let it go. Um, but people, I, you've worked with so many bands. Like, I, I don't know if you see that dynamic where people get, people get defensive about it. I think one person wants to do something, one person wants to do something, so they're at loggerheads, right? 
All the time. Yeah, and and sometimes it's sort of like, hey, look, we're we're here. Like, what what does it cost? You know, why why be self protective or let's what, just try it? Yeah, what does it cost us? Right. Yeah, we always have to try it. The other thing is, is when you're sharing an idea, I tell you my idea, you imagine something. What you're imagining and what I'm imagining often are nothing alike. Yeah. Just because language is so imperfect. And we all have wild imaginations. You know, we yeah. can all picture, we can all hear the words of a song and imagine a very different story from the, or from a poem, you know? Yeah. So when you actually do do the test and try it, then everyone at least is on the same page because we just heard the same thing. So at least we're talking about the same thing. We're not arguing about a theoretical idea. Yeah. I was pretty moved watching the, um, that Beatles thing that Peter Jackson put together. Did you get, did you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I. Seeing the songs come out of nothing. Nothing. Was shocking. So amazing. But I also, it doesn't, it doesn't even matter what the cultural, you know, the way that we, you know, we take the stories of creative acts that we like, like the White Album or Let It Be or whatever like that. And you, and then you get this, there's all this reductivism. It just happens. Legends get born and people say Yoko broke up the band and this was going on and that was going on. Right. But you realize that apart from it just being silly, there's, there's something sad about reducing complicated things that happen to stories of conflict, right? And I've had that happen to me. People still say like, you know, uh, this film was, you know, became a fight. And it's like, no, it didn't. It, 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 like they, I, I did a film, American History X, that, that, you know, has really endured a lot of people. Like, the thing I'm, it was a strange process because the, the guy who directed it, Tony, was a was a very eccentric figure. I've met Tony. Yeah, very very eccentric. Yes. Um, beautifully so. Yes. In many ways, there are many things that, and the truth is, our process on that was totally non traditional, but really vital, really vital, and um, and I didn't begrudge him his eccentricities at all, and actually. I, he was really appreciative to me. The things that went on, they were nuanced and complicated and they had phases of, you know, do we trust each other? Are we living thing? You go, you go through a process. And then he got into sort of this, he, he got into some things with the studio over wanting more time. And there, you know, sometimes just practical, practical exigencies come and, and, you know, you have to abandon the piece ultimately, like you have to finish it. Yeah. And nobody's ever like, you know, if something's good, maybe you're never done. And he didn't want to be done. And it, it came down to that. But um, but then in retrospect, people love the film. Yeah, exactly, absolutely. We, and I think he does. And, and I and I do. Of course, there's you, anything coming. You look at, oh, yeah, you know, I, 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 mm, I maybe that or this or that. You, you always hold that if you were inside it. Right. There's no taking away from the fact of how that affected people. It still affects people, you know, and um and when I look at it, I'm, I'm like, wow, a lot of what was being expressed not only didn't go away, it went away from the margins and became much more central in American life in scary ways. You know, the rage that it was really about has bloomed. It hasn't, it, it hasn't gone more marginal. And, but the point was then, then you just get subjected to like people saying, oh, there was a fight because it's salacious and it's, you know, good copy or whatever. And you kind of just, you go through that experience and you know that for whatever reason, sometimes people like to focus on the idea of conflict that went into creative things. LMNT, Element Electrolytes. Have you ever felt dehydrated after an intense workout or a long day in the sun? Do you want to maximize your endurance and feel your best? Add element electrolytes to your daily routine. Perform better and sleep deeper. Improve your cognitive function. Experience an increase in steady energy with fewer headaches and fewer muscle cramps. Element electrolytes. Drink it in the sauna. Refreshing flavors include grapefruit, citrus, watermelon, and for a limited time, chocolate medley, which you can enjoy hot. Formulated with the perfect balance of sodium, 
potassium and magnesium to keep you hydrated and energized throughout the day. These minerals help conduct the electricity that powers your nervous system so you can perform at your very best. Element electrolytes are sugar-free, keto-friendly, and great tasting. Minerals are the stuff of life. So visit drinklmnt.com slash tetra. And stay salty with Element Electrolyte. L-M-N-T. Tell me about that project from the start. How did, how did the project come to be? That one? David McKenna wrote this edgy, weird story of a young skinhead getting sent to jail and trying to change his life. And I was really struck by it. Um, David and I went and worked on it for months together. To My argument to him was that it wasn't a milieu piece. It was actually Othello, right? It really was that if you think about, like, not to get too academic, but the Greek idea of tragedy, which Shakespeare picked up and took on into a, a kind of a, an extension it has in it this idea of like the fatal flaw that a person of enormous capabilities and beauty and, and potential brings themselves low through an excess of one like characteristic, you know? And I've always liked that. Even when I was a kid and I was learning about drama, I thought it's such a neat idea that like your strength taken to excess becomes your weakness. Your weakness isn't like a, thing, it is actually your best quality taken too far can be the thing that, that actually, you know, hurts you or impedes you. It's an amazing idea. And I thought, I said to David, like, what if we approach this not as just sort of a punk rock film about skinheads and things? What if he's, what if he's in that tradition of Othello and Macbeth and Oedipus, like people who were on their way, could have been great and and instead their story becomes a tragedy because something and i said to david i said i think what you're what's unsaid and but let's make it explicit is that it's about rage it's about anger it's a it's about you know this person brought low by the way that rage erodes his life and and once we hooked onto that it, it got exciting to us because we felt like we can work in what for us is kind of a punk rock way. Mm -hmm. We can shoot like down and dirty and in black and white and in Venice. And we weren't gonna listen to white power music, but we had like Fugazi's 13 songs in our head and we had Minor Threat. You know, we, there was a lot I grew up on that like when you talk about channeling, I felt like that's the energy of this. This is the, that's the way we wanna make it. It's the energy that's being expressed in it. And so for us, it was like, we, we can have, you know, a kind of a, a gorilla attitude but we can have a classical, a classical value in it, a, a dramatic ambition that that's, which elevates the whole piece. That's heightened, yeah. right? And it doesn't take away from the gritty story. Yeah, yeah. No, it's still, it's, it's really. I mean, we made that movie for nothing. Like, like. I mean, when did Tony get involved? So I can't really remember the the studio. You know, he hadn't made any films. He had shot. Um, he shot a lot of commercials. He was a, he was a very like he was a kind of a cutting edge commercial director mostly. And when we all, David and Tony and I kind of bonded over it, he, it, it was funny. He and I, I think actually agreed that we weren't sure that I was, you know, pull that off, right? That was what really drew me to it. But I was cautious. I thought, you know, you gotta see. So Tony and I decided to do a test and I, I didn't, I didn't bulk up yet, I, but I, I kind of lifted, I shaved my head and we put a lot of tattoos on and we did, we shot, we shot this like improvised kind of thing where a lot of what David and I put into some of the character speeches we made up and we shot it and Tony and I looked at it together and we went, this is kind of working. This is pretty interesting, you know? And so then we, we kind of all jumped in, you know, he, he was really interesting cause he's, a, he's a great photographer. Maybe it's his greatest strength. And, and you talk about availability, he's extremely available. He does not come at things with many preconceptions. <laughs> he actually did a really funny thing that I really liked. One time we had a really great dinner. We were, just, we were just talking the whole thing and it was very vital and we were excited about the whole thing. And it was, I think he was very lit up and he, he grabbed this piece of paper 
and in kind of an artistic kind of way, he just wrote the date on a piece of paper and he stuck it out the window in the rain so that the, he wrote something like, Tony and Edward, this night, this date, blah, 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 blah. And he stuck it out in the rain. So the rain hit the ink and kind of, and then he took it and he was like, he was like, let's keep that. You know what I mean? It was really, it was like, and that's kind of who he was. You know, he was really, he was very impressionistic and very okay. stuff. And when we would work, he, he did all the lighting and, and, and he, he shot the movie, but he also operated the movie. He operated every camera. You know, he was really- It was a tiny crew and he did tiny, a lot of yeah, stuff. Yeah, but also he, he, a lot of times there was a great first AD on that film named Mark Catone, who was brilliant and really down for kind of the, the gorilla way we were working. And a lot of times Tony would come on the set and just say, to me, he would go, you know, directing actors wasn't his thing, particularly. Because he had never really done was that. staging anything. Yeah. And he was often saying to me, will you rehearse it? He knew David with, and I had basically done the, worked on the script and then I was, so he would have me kind of direct the actors and work with the actors and get the, get the scenario set up. And he actually liked to be brought in only when he could sort of sit and watch something. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, he would just go, it's so fucking bright, it's, it's so great. And then he would just start going light here, light there, real fast, you know, put the, sh on my rig, put, put the rig on my shoulder and let's rock, you know. He would quickly do the mental math of I'm gonna do this and this and this and this and this, let's rock, you know. And we were often just rocking and rolling and going so fast and he would literally fling one handheld thing with the mag off his shoulder as it ran out and have him drop another one on. I, I've never, you know, it was almost like we never stopped. Wow. It was crazy. He shot like, he shot like 2 million feet of film on a, on a short, on this movie. It was crazy. And it, but it was very vital. And um, it, it was great. I mean, honestly, like I, I, the whole experience was, was, was really, um, it was the way you want to work when you're that age and everything. And it, you know, the, the, the process, it took over a year, the editing of it, because Tony was nuts. I mean, he, he brought in a commercial editor and they cut a thing and the story wasn't there. And then, but the studio gave him a lot of time and, and we worked together. And I actually went and brought, people said, I cut the movie, I didn't cut the movie. I, I, I actually just like, Tony went away. He went away to do a gig. He kind of actually took a break from the whole thing. And we were left sort of sitting there going, what are we gonna do? And I, I, I never cut the film. I just, I, I kind of put an assembly of the raw materials together so that we could try to recruit. I think Tony agreed, as I remember, that maybe his commercial editor wasn't the guy to cut it, but we couldn't recruit somebody because we didn't really have a thing. So we, we, put the, we put the whole thing together, almost like just like a master, you know? And out of that, we got this guy named Jerry Greenberg who had cut um, The French Connection, Apocalypse Now, Kramer versus Kramer legend, you know, and Jerry Greenberg was the guy who really came in and really made it the film that it is. And it was, the truth is it wound up like really positively, the stuff that everybody talked about being conflict later was kind of, in my opinion, looking way back on it, I think it was more than anything, Tony being anxious about the moment when you have to say, I'm finished. And he sort of spun out on the idea that it was complete and that it was done and started insisting on more time and kind of got into a little bit of almost a performance arty kind of mode in his fight with the studio. You know what I mean? And that's who Tony is too. He is a bit of a performance artist. Absolutely. You know, his life and his conduct of life within art is kind of a piece unto itself. Yeah, he doesn't and, turn it off. He that's actually right. is. That's right. Which he again, actually is a performance. Yes, artist. and there's and there's a point at which standing back from you can you can kind of go to what made him unique and and kind of hilarious and great. It got to a place where it was starting to become a practical impediment to having something that was more than good enough. It was really working. Yeah, and in a way, I always said to people like that. People were saying like, "Why is he doing this? Are you in a fight with him?" And I was like, "I'm not in a fight with him at all." Like, like I'm actually sort of, I ended up feeling sorrowful that he cut himself out from the pleasure of the result. 
and not 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 the credit. He directed the film, but in a way, he cut himself. He cut himself off at the last minute from the ability to do that best thing when you've come through the whole thing together and you all put your arms around each other's shoulders and put your heads together and go, we did, we did this, yeah. you know. Have we, you ever done it since? With him? Yeah, have no, you ever I, done, I, have you ever had that head down moment, no, hug, we no, did it? I've never run into him. It's really, uh, really weird. I, I, don't I, know. I feel like today that would happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've, even, I've even heard secondhand that he, I've heard, I've heard from a distance that he acknowledges that in some ways that he, it's, it's kind of what we were talking about, the, the way the brain can spin you up into a negative space, I, th I think maybe he maybe he knows in a way that like it's endured it. And by the way, that's the thing I like in your book too. It's like you get a thing done. It's not it's it's not yours the minute you're done. Number one is things move so far from what they were when you conceived them. It's very very difficult to wrangle things into what was in your head, and they become what they become, and then all these unexpected things happen. You know, they take on a life of their yeah, own. Yeah, and people form a relationship with them. They see things in them that you didn't intend. They relate to them. They misinterpret them. They interpret them in ways that are cool that you didn't intend. And in a way, you, you know, for Tony, like, I think may, maybe now, maybe all this time later, he's able to see that it, it's had a beautiful life. Yeah. Like, it, it's had a beautiful life that everything in, in the intentional sense, which was to affect people, he achieved it like in spades, and um, and so the great. film wouldn't be the film unless all of the things that happened happened. Yeah, yeah, but again, the whole process was it was right up there in the at that time in my life. I was like, this is the way I want to work. Yeah, this is the way I want to work. I want to work. I don't want to do John Grisham movies. You know, like I I, I don't I just didn't want to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is what I want to do, mm -hmm. and then these are the kinds of things I want to say. And I was getting to. The interesting thing about that one, have you ever listened to things you worked on at a certain time and think, wow, like it's so different than I thought it was at the time. You know what I mean? Like where you're like older now and you look at a thing and you go, oh, I thought it worked because of X. But in fact, when I listen, now I see it in a totally different light, you know, yeah. or I hear it in a different way or whatever. On that one, I was with some people some people hadn't seen it. I was with Bradley Cooper and some other people, and he was exhorting these people to watch that film, you know. And so, so someone screened it, right? And I and I hadn't watched it in I don't I don't know how long, more than twenty years, you know. I just did the thing, and I had to really. I had a really interesting experience. It was very it's powerful, but the thing that really struck me was that I thought when we made it, like I thought I was a man, you know. Like I thought, yeah. I thought I was expressing myself as a forceful adult person. You know, you, you tell yourself, yeah, look, I got, I got some muscles on me. I got the ink. It's powerful. It's iconic. It looks good. Yeah. And I thought it worked. Back then I thought it worked because I was doing something muscular and powerful, right? And when I watched it and actually teared up a few yeah. times watching it, I watched, I, t I realized I was tearing up because it's about kids. Yeah. It's not because I'm a man and yeah. for, it's not working for the reasons I thought it was working. Yeah. It's working because it's about really young people yeah. fucking themselves up yeah. around rage and sadness. And, and I was looking at it going, it works more because he thinks he's a man. Yeah. And then, f and then fails so horribly and in a way is barely growing up or, or is about to grow up when the consequences hit him, Yeah, you know? But I, but I really thought like, holy crap. You were the character. Yeah, but I really thought like, look how, you, I mean, I was a kid, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, and, I, and that's, that's kind of wild to also to realize like that you, you have a relationship with a thing and it's not even really necessarily, it's not necessarily communicating in the way you think it's communicating. Maybe at some levels it is. I don't, think, I don't think we can know. I don't think no. we can ever really know. No, no. But that, in a funny way, it's like, I feel like all those things, the kind of headspace I was in, when you're in your 20s, like you, you, your, your aspirations are so different. Or, or hopefully they are. I think if your aspirations don't change as you get older, you're in big trouble. 
in a way, <laughs> you know, like the aspirations apart from ego and apart from wanting applause, wanting money, wanting any, whatever it is you think you're asserting any things. I also think like, I, I think I was interested in wanting to, ass I, I wanted to assert uh, uh, an ability to channel things that weren't like me. You know what I mean? Yeah. And in a weird way, over time, I've gotten this place where I'm like, I don't say totally have lost my interest, but I, I've definitely lost my interest in violence. You know, like I don't, I, I was super interested in some of the things that I think young men get polluted by and they gave me the chance to exercise certain kinds of muscles. And I was very uninterested in things that came close to my own vulnerabilities or experiences or whatever. I really wanted to incarnate things. I'm, I'm more and more interested in things that are closer to home. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's an honesty in what's really happening. Yeah, and did you read Barbarian Days? Did you read that book? Mm -mm. This kind of you know, a highly celebrated writer at the New Yorker who turned out had this whole young life was like, just chased surf all over the world and surfed at a lot of the places like Tavarua and long before other people went there. And it's called a surfing life, but it, it's a meditation on, on getting older. I, I take it as like a, a look back at the way that when you're young, you're pushing yourself toward an aspirational idea of what you want to be, even though in many ways what you are is more present and unencumbered. And the older you get, as you get toward those aspirations, you actually are looking back, wanting to retain that unencumbered feeling of just being present. I, I relate, I relate to that. I relate to, um, in all ways, the challenge in life is, is like recovering simplicity you know, it gets really hard to recover yeah. the state of mind. And, and it's gotten worse. I mean, I, I, I think I do agree with like, if you read Walt Whitman's poem, Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, which I think is honestly one of the greatest pieces of American art ever, because it, it's so wild how he's saying in the poem, you, 200 years hence, I am thinking about you more than you can possibly know. And you're looking back to me and I'm telling you that the dark days that fall on you, they fell on me. The horrors of fratricidal war, that was known to me. It's like such a, a wild thing, the way he is like, everything you're going through, I went through it the wharfs along the edge of the river in Manhattan, I walked there too. I looked at the light on the water. And when I was living in New York young, I remember reading that and just like feeling like a time portal was, this guy opens a time portal and he's talking to you through it. And he, and he has this stretch in that where he says, you know, there never was any more age or beauty than there was now or ever will be. And sometimes I think that's true. Sometimes I think obviously like, the balances and the, the difficulty of achieving balance, that it's the same. It's the same in different forms in all ages and people's existential challenges are the same. And in a way that's like, you know, that's what the Dharma says too. It's like, you're in a state of anxiety that's rooted in your, your animal nature, your desires. You gotta stand to the side of yourself and see that to be able to, to let go, right? But at the same time, like it's also incontestable to me that we are succeeding in creating more noise and distraction around ourselves with every passing year. And I, I know there was things in the seventies when we were growing up television and stuff, but these things in our hands now, the, the attention span, the assault on attention span and the, the assault on slow thinking, quiet, it's just unreal. It's unreal. I, I'm shackled to it for a whole variety of reasons that are, that are rationalizations, but 
you tell yourself, yeah, but I got my guitar tuner on it. <laughs> right? You're like, yeah, I, can have, I got a guitar tuner that pl- goes on to the end thing too. I don't need my fucking phone for that. Like, and you say like, well, but I like to check the tides, right? Or I like to do this. But then there's the crack cocaine on it that you just get sucked into and you're just like, this is just noise. It doesn't make you feel good. No, it's just noise. And um, I'm sure our parents were worried about television in the way we're worried about social media. But I can't say I think those are entirely the same thing. I feel like um, the age of uh, assault on your attention is, the good news is I think people are talking about it. I I don't think it's like, I don't think we're all just, I don't think we're unaware and it's happened fast and caught us. But I, I do think, I do think there's awareness and there's some communication going on. There's a lot of people who are discussing it. Welcome to the house of macadamias. Macadamias are a delicious superfood, sustainably sourced directly from farmers. Macadamias, a rare source of omega-7, linked to collagen regeneration, enhanced weight management, and better fat metabolism. Macadamias are healthy and brain-boosting fats. Macadamias, paleo-friendly, keto and plant-based. Macadamias, no wheat, no dairy, no gluten, no GMOs, no preservatives, no palm oil, no added sugar. House of Macadamias, by roasted with Namibian sea salt, cracked black pepper, and chocolate dips. Snack bars come in chocolate, coconut white chocolate, and blueberry white chocolate. Visit houseofmacadamias.com slash tetra. When did you get into surfing? I got into surfing later and uh, I actually was working on a film in China and I, I had an accident doing a, st- a stunt and I, I broke my back. I, I, you know, I, it sounds really dramatic. I, I cracked three vertebrae, right? I, do you I, normally do stunts? It depends. I mean, everybody does. There's some blurry line between what, like a level of that, that you actually learn it. There's techniques and and it's it's fun to figure it out. It plays into the character. Yeah, and, also. and it's fun to figure out the puzzle, even of like in filmmaking, especially the, to figure out how do you do that stuff and make it look great. What was the stunt? safely? But but no, this was this was um this was like a beautiful film about forgiveness called the Painted Veil. But what was the? How did you get hurt? What oh, I got t- chucked off a horse. Oh. I was I was a horse a horse got that I was on got spooked. You know, just bucked me off and I landed funny. But my father was living in Indonesia then. And when the film was over, I went down there to hang out with him and recuperate. And How did your dad come to live in Indonesia? He was doing conservation work. Yeah, he was, he's, he's a big conservation uh, pioneer and environmental advocate and program builder. And he was, he was working um, for a big conservation organization down there. And... Um, I met someone introduced me to um, famous Indonesian surfer Rizal, a great, great guy. And it actually first appealed to me because it looked like it was the direction I wanted to stretch my back. You know what I mean? I needed to open my back up. I was really locked up. And also I had, I was a sailor and when did you get into into sailing? When I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. I, I grew up near the Chesapeake Bay and I learned, I learned to sail and, I loved, I, I loved the ocean. I loved sailing and scuba diving and I had windsurfed and everything. I just had never surfed. So I started doing it like in my thirties and I just got completely addicted to it. It, it really, um, I think it's like the thing that I've found that I can have a positive addictive relationship with. Yeah. I, ne- I never had a, you know, a toxic addiction. All, all those sugar and shit like that is, is definitely in the matrix for me, but, um, but it's just the kind of thing that 
I feel like surfing is like music. It's, it's infinite. You will never assess it or encompass it because the movement of water and waveform is so infinite and so nuanced and so beautiful and so changeable that just like a musician, all you're trying to do is get yourself inside the pocket of that flow and have the ephemeral moment of getting in sync with that energy. And it doesn't matter how many times you do it. There's no guarantee you're going to get it right the next time. And every single place you go and do it, you can do it. I mean, you know, we, we have the Takuji's our friend, you know, one of the great surfers and, you know, Pied Pipers of surfing and everything. And I, I know being when, I, when you're in the water with someone who's done it their entire life, they're still watching the water and the way it's moving toward them and doing all these micro reads. I mean, it, it's the ultimate in availability to the moment because you have to perceive what is actually just taking place right now and get yourself in the sync with it. And it's good for you physically. It's great mentally. It just completely, I mean, I have to say like, I it's love the it. antidote to the social media. That it is. It's, it's the it's, exact opposite. And it's, and I gotta say in a funny way, like I love doing yoga. I like, um, there's something about surfing that it might be for me, it's like the most accelerated gateway to a clear mind. Mm -hmm. Like it, um, and presence. Yeah. Presence. It's your, and, you're so in so the like moment. you do, you do yoga to prepare to meditate or, or you meditate and you focus on your breath and you get, you work toward emptying your mind and then you hear your mind come in and then it pings you back. And then you go there, there it is again. Let me try to let it go again. There, there I am again, you know, and, um, and all, all of it's great. Every single form of that kind of practice, literally, whether it's yoga or meditation or scuba diving or anything that gets you through into that, that state is great. Sometimes because of how noisy life is and the fact that I'll get into periods where I'm like, I cannot shut my brain off. You know, like, it's just like the, I've electively chosen to take on a lot of stuff and it's overstimulating my lists. You know, it's not even, it's not social media shit like that for me as much, although that will be this cheap. Fun projects, things you're yeah, excited no, about. Thing. But, but it's like the Radiohead song, Spinning Plates, you know? Sometimes you just go, what have I done to myself? Yeah. What have I done to myself? Why have I done this? Yeah. Like it's an embarrassment of riches for yeah. sure. Yeah. I know I'm lucky. I know that there's very little I'm doing in my life that I don't want to do for positive reasons, you know, other than taxes or whatever, you know what I mean? So it's, it's an embarrassment of riches and it's an uptown problem for sure. Lucky problem to have to, to sort of electively take on a lot of things that are interesting. And you're missing life. Across oh. Yes. That's what's so wild. Yeah. It's so wild to realize that you have, you've built Pink Floyd's wall. No one else built it around you. You built it. And you're trying to take the bricks off the wall. You get to a point in life and you're like, all I want to do is take bricks off this wall. <laughs> you know, and... Um, but then you can imagine, but if I put this brick on top here, it's yeah. going to look so cool. And there's the compulsion to engage with things that are that are thrilling, vital, fun, people who are great. Sometimes it's like you can't help yourself. And then lo and behold, you're sitting there with your brain in a state of anxiety that the, the literal lists you've made or the ones, or even worse, the brain bouncing around worried that it's forgotten something on the list, right? <laughs> You know, Fight Club has that great line, the things you own end up owning you. That's definitely true in a material sense. But there's a non-material version of that where the things that you've engaged in become this, uh, this, this matrix of, of noisy mind that you can't. And you're like, where's my time to read? 
you know, like where's my time to just listen to music. Or just be. With no agenda or hang out with kids or, or walk in the beat, you know, all of it. And and then you, then it becomes this thing of, of um, going, you got to get in the practice going, I can't, I can't do everything every day. I just can't like, and I, and there, and so you got to put the balance, but it's funny, like, like great literature or music. Like there's sometimes you think you knew what something was about when you were young, then you like read it again when you're older, like Marquez's books or, but I, I do think like the wall, like the wall is really interesting, right? Because we loved it when we were kids because hey, teacher, leave those kids alone. Or there was like these little, there's these things you grabbed in it, right? You grabbed, you grabbed what applied to you at the time. I like laid back and listened to that whole thing one night. I, I couldn't, couldn't go to sleep and I was like, fuck it. I have these good new headphones. I put it on and I listened to the wall, like all the way through, which I hadn't done in a long time. And I was like, wow, like this is really about self-imprisonment. You know, it really is this like thing of like, am I going to be able to to deconstruct the the thing I put around myself? And I really, I had this whole different response to it. Um, the The thing is that you were saying what's acting, and I'm saying like like I feel pretty disconnected from it right now, just because my my last big personal diary entry was this film I wrote and directed, Motherless Brooklyn. And it was completely satisfying to me. Like I was, you know, you always care because people invest in, you know, back you and whatever. But I really like needed to just exercise it, right? Like I had worked on it, put it down for like eight years. Wow. I wrote half of it. Tell me the story from the beginning. Well, there was a, there's a book called Motherless Brooklyn uh, by Jonathan Latham, wonderful novel about a guy with Tourette syndrome and obsessive compulsive disorder. It's a modern novel. It's a detective story. From when? The nineties, like the late, late nineties. But it's the pleasure of it wasn't the plot. It was the, the head, the, the inside, the journey inside the head of this character. And I related to it like so intensively, like really like the way in Joseph Conrad's, you know, heart of darkness, Marlowe's looking at Kurtz and going that, I'm looking down into the void and there he is and I'm just on the edge of it. Mother's Brooklyn's funny and empathetic and warm, but I really was like, I really do feel sometimes if 20 synapses had been wired differently, I might be a really painful version of obsessive compulsive, just, you know, or teretic or whatever. I related so much to the, to that aspect of it that like words triggering compulsive mental play with the words, phrases, rhythms, lines, sounds, you know, and the need to repeat them and the need to twist them around and make a rhyme out of, I mean, it's just like, I, I really related to it. And then separately and kind of in parallel, I was really interested in, in this guy named Robert Moses, who, you know, from growing up, you know, Robert Moses State Park. Yeah. He's this, he's this, towering figure in New York and American history who, who was very poorly understood until this great book called The Power Broker was written about him. And in many ways, you could argue that he was the Darth Vader of American life in the 20th century. He, he was like Anakin Skywalker, a, a Jedi, like a, a person of incredible capabilities who went to the dark side actually went over to the dark side and did incredible damage to the social fabric of New York based on racism and based on power and based on all these things. And, and people thought he was the parks commissioner. And, and, and I was fascinated by, I was fascinated by him. And I was fascinated by the idea of um, the way that like injustices become systemic you know, they get, they get baked into the actual way our society is built. But he seemed kind of, um, he seemed esoteric in a way, like, like the kind of thing that you could tell yourself the lie that you could make a movie like a Citizen Kane about him. And you could say, yeah, I'm going to make Citizen Kane. But in the back of my mind, I knew you needed a vehicle for looking at him. So I had this wild idea to use the Tourette detective 
as the vehicle for to great looking idea. at what happened. But I had to go great to, idea. Yeah, I had to go. I had to go to uh, Jonathan, who wrote My Lewis Brooklyn. And there's, this is a nice thing. And I said to him, I, I got the craziest idea. And I said, but I can't do this without your permission, honestly. Like I, I said, I, I want to take your character, but I want to like Philip Marlowe or I, I want to take your detective and I want to send him in, off into another adventure. I, I still want to explore like the idea that his boss and the only person who understood him is murdered. But I want, I want what he unspools, the thread that he pulls on I want it to be a vector for looking at what Robert Moses did to New York in the and in, in, in the It's the coolest idea. In the fifties. And thank God he he said, Hey, I wrote my book. You don't have to, I don't need you to rewrite my book. And he said, I love films. Many of the best adaptations are springboards into something. Did you different. always know you wanted to call it Motherless Brooklyn? It's such a great title. I see. Such a great title. I see. And the other but the other thing is he didn't write Motherless Brooklyn about Robert Moses and and the and what happened in the bifurcating of the neighborhoods, you know, he he it was my, but motherless Brooklyn is such a great. That's what happened to the city. Yes, no one was looking out for it. Yeah, you know, and all these places that we know, these places that were communities, the African American communities in Brooklyn and the Jewish communities in the Bronx, and they ravaged them. They they. They chased people out. They did unbelievably scuzzy and destructive things and, and purposely put highways through the middle of portions of them. You know, there was, there was a lot about the way that they remade New York from the 19th century city into the 20th century city that was, that was purposely and cruelly and unnecessarily destructive, you know, including even things that sound apocryphal, but that were true, Robert Moses, dreamed up many of the parks and the parkways and things like Jones Beach. He also intentionally had the overpasses set at a height that buses would not be able to go under them so that minorities couldn't go to Jones Beach. Wow. Yeah. Um, and that, that's true. He, wow. he really did that. Wow. Really, really tried to make sure that public transportation would keep minorities from his new public beaches. And I love the idea of like, of motherless people and but of mother, of whole communities that no one's looking out for, you know. Thankfully, Jonathan like now he gave me his blessing. He was like, "I'm fascinated." He's like, "I love this idea," and he let me do this wild transposition of his character into a totally different story. And um, you know, and I had when I moved to New York when I was in my early twenties, I I worked in housing. I worked in affordable housing finance and and I used to go around in all these neighborhoods and everything. So it was really it connected to a lot for me. And I um and I really wanted to get it done. But when I went to write my own mystery, my own Chinatown, I got really hung up. I got really hung up in the in the jigsaw puzzle of it. And then I was, you know, because I was lucky and I had gigs coming at me and I was like, I'm gonna put it down and I'll do this gig. And I lost, you know, I lost it. I lost the thread. I lost the momentum, I lost the impetus. And it kind of was like there. And it was haunting, it haunted me for like 10 years. Wow. And I kept saying, yeah, I'm gonna pick it back up. And finally a friend at a studio, he stuck a fork in me, he was like, maybe I should give this to someone else. You know, maybe I should let someone else have the right so you can still play the role or whatever. It kind of like smacked me in the face in a good way. And I was like, what are you gonna do? You Are you gonna, you know, What's going to satisfy you more than finishing this? Mm -hmm. Nothing. And if you don't, you're going to, it's going to be an actual regret. Yes. Like an actual regret, not like a passing thing. Like you're going to regret it if you don't see this through. So I finally, I finally picked it back up and I bounced it around with the writer friend. And it was really weird. It was like, the thing I'd been so hung up on, it unlocked like that. Yeah. Like it just, and it wasn't just like in my sleep. I came up with it. It just, enough time had gone by and something that seemed illogical to me just suddenly didn't anymore. I, I, it, it just unlocked. And then I did it really fast. You know, I did it in a big salvo of, you know, a, a whole bunch of nights of just staying up all night, sleeping in the day, writing all night, sleeping in the day. And I finally got it done. And um, then it took me a while to get the, you know, 
figure out how to get it made. So much of today's life happens on the web. Squarespace is your home base for building your dream presence in an online world. Designing a website is easy using one of Squarespace's best in-class templates. With the built-in style kit, you can change fonts, imagery, margins, and menus. So your design will be perfectly tailored to your needs. Discover unbreakable creativity with Fluid Engine, a highly intuitive drag and drop editor. No coding or technical experience is required. Understand your site's performance with in-depth website analytics tools. Squarespace has everything you need to succeed online. Create a blog, monetize a newsletter, make a marketing portfolio, launch an online store. The Squarespace app helps you run your business from anywhere. Track inventory and connect with customers while you're on the go. Whether you're just starting out or already managing a successful brand, Squarespace makes it easy to create and customize a beautiful website. Visit squarespace.com slash tetra and get started today. How hard is it to get a movie made? Well, we're in a, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you feel this is true in music too, but the, we're in a golden era for storytelling, narrative storytelling is in a golden era. Now it might not be the form we grew up with where you went to the cinema all the time and everything, but I, but the, what's happened in terms of streaming platforms and all the business of it all, you can gripe about the change in the form and the change in the way it's delivered and where people are seeing what they're seeing and all of it. And it, it's true, but at the same time, what effectively has happened is that people have set up these blast furnaces and they need coal. You know, there was a, there was a series that I loved called um, I May Destroy You. I don't know if you ever saw that. Mm -hmm. This British Ghanaian woman, Michaela Cole, wrote, directed and stars in this it's so good. It's so brilliant. And to me, it's an example of like, there is so much more diversity of storytelling now. So many more, so many different voices are finding their way. The forms have been exploded. It's not all two hours and 20 minutes. You know, it's like multi-part and three-part and 10-part and multi-seasons and big long films. And I think it's almost indisputable that if you there are more doors to knock on, more forms, more ways, and more types of storytellers getting to do their, their stuff than ever. All the things people are saying about making, you know, democratizing it more, all true, all great. You'll, it, it just be pushed and pushed and pushed. But I don't think anybody can contend with the fact that there are more ways to get things done today mm -hmm. than there ever have been. Mm -hmm. And that's cool. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's cool. I think certain types of things like aren't getting made as theatrical films as much anymore. But you got to decide at a certain point if you care. Like, do you know? It's like I, I got a lot of vinyl records. I still like to put them on. But I can't pretend that I also don't love moving around in the world with the entirety of all music that's ever been made available to me. I love it, you know, I love it. I love being able to like, what's the flea turn me on to like Pharaoh Sanders, the, the, his, that last record or whatever, you know? And, and it's like- Floating points. Yeah, where, where would I find, to be able to get tipped off to something and then settle in with it. And oh, so great, you know, so great. I love the availability of, of that. It's, mm -hmm. that's like, you know, it's great. When's the last time you went to the cinema to see a movie? I saw some things in the last in the last couple weeks. I didn't go. Uh, I mean, I you know it sounds fancy, but I a, f a friend with a screening room put some things. So I love seeing things on big screens. Mm -hmm. I, I I love it. You know, the, no matter how big your home TV is, it's not quite the same as watching it in a room with other people. I I love that. This is it's funny because I I I wanted to ask you a question. It, it flows up and out of what we're talking about, which is like. After I did Motherless Brooklyn, 
I felt satiated in a way, like exhausted, but I got to fully exercise. I got to fully realize the thing that had been in my head for a long time. That was great. It was great as an actor. I really loved and related to the character. I got to express something. I got to write it. I got to direct it. I had great, great, great actors that I absolutely adored in it. And one of the biggest unexpected things was that I got to produce all this music in it, right? Great. Tom York wrote a new track for me. He played it for me in a demo. And I got to go to Oxford and work with him on that. This brilliant composer, Daniel Pemberton, we worked night after night after night on the music together and recorded it in Abbey Road. Great. And in Air Studios, uh, George Martin's yeah. other place. And and Wynton Marsalis and his band created the music for a jazz band in a jazz club that's like Miles Davis's quintet. So I got to work with Wynton on recording, Incredible. re-recording a Mingus piece and a Clifford Brown piece. And, and then Wynton and his quintet played the sort of new ballad standards that Daniel wrote and we recorded. So I got to like make music in Abbey Road in New York with Winton in Oxford with Tom. And I got to really actually produce all that and cut it and weave it into the thing. And, you know, I, I've directed other films, but this was like, and it was like an exalted experience for me. Yeah. Getting to work with those people. Absolutely. On that kind of music and to Absolutely. shape shape the music. I'm, I, I I play, but like it, it was like I got to I got to slip into a world that you guys work in all the time and do it in a way that was such a it was so gratifying. Like I never wanted it to end. You know, it was so much fun. And then I finished it and then COVID, you know, hit, which was fine with I mean, that was fine with me creatively. I, I was looking for a big sabbatical for my mind and everything anyway. And I've done one or two things, but I really like, almost like just gave myself a permission to um, just stop and, and almost go through the, the, the crucible, the, 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 like a junkie, you know, like the brain yeah, and the what ego. What am I supposed to be doing What now? am I doing? Or... I gotta work. Like, what yeah. am I doing? What, yeah. are, what are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah. There's a, the voice like screaming in your head, like you, you're crazy not to gig, you know, or you're crazy not to work. And I almost had to like let that fade a little to even get around to a point of going, it feels distant, super distant. And that feels good, fine. Yeah. Like really, really good and fine. And the last year or two, I, I've actually had to like repeatedly kind of meditate, talk to myself and just go do an exercise of like imagining I'm on my deathbed yeah, and I'm looking back and knowing that I want like a tapestry. I don't want the repetitive experience of playing dress up and make believe ad infinitum, like I want to do other things. I want to like just experience other things. And, and then I read this, um, I actually read this essay that Václav Havel wrote, the, you know, the guy who was the playwright who became the president of Czechoslovakia, incredible figure. And he wrote this, this essay called Second Wind. And he, he basically said that in a creative life, you do this wave of work and you exhaust it. And then you have two choices you can start to repeat that work in one form or another. You can essentially keep revisiting the same ideas or you can stop and refill yourself with life and be willing to start again. A whole new adventure. Yeah. And I love that. I, I, it's scary. Yeah. It's definitely scary. It definitely like has, has given me some moments of, all the brain, you know, mm -hmm. wobbles, insecurity, like, is anybody gonna let you back in and do it? Are you gonna know how to do it? And that's why I was saying at the very beginning, like, I'm getting damn close to this place where I'm like, I don't, I don't really, I'm not sure. Yeah, you know how to do it. Did I know how to do it? That's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
I think that's good because I think um, I'm not physically the same person anymore. I don't look the same. And I think, and, and there's a part of me that thinks that that's even good within what, what acting is at its best. It's like, I, I do have that thing where I'm like, I'm seeing these people too much. I can't, I can't let go, you know, or there, there's some of my favorite actors who I think have, you, you know, you kind of forget about them. Yeah. And, and then it's like, whoa. But that's hard to do if, 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 if you're working like relentlessly, you know? Mm. But I, the thing I, I was going to ask you is I, when I pulled up, I was playing um, the Chili Peppers track, White, White Braids and Pillow Chairs from that, uh, I guess not the, you guys did another one, but the, from the Unlimited Same Love. Set. Yeah, we, Unlimited, we that, that whole ones. thing. I think it's one of the best things they've ever done. And in particular, I think the back half of the second record, which isn't the stuff, you know, that makes the radio and it wasn't, it's not even what they've been playing out in, in tours and I've seen everything, but like those tracks, like It's Only Natural and White Braids and Pillow Chairs and She's a Lover and Let Them Cry. They're in such a fucking groove in that, like I went down on that like a kid with the first U2 record or with, the, you know, I mean, or, or like the class, you know, I mean, I was listening to it over and over and over again. And, you know, I, I've been friends with those guys a long, long time. I think they're playing at a level of musicianship. And I think Anthony wrote some so that song when I was playing. I think it's like one of the best songs he's ever written. It's just unbelievable. Like there's just not a lot of people who have been making music together for over 30 years who still, in my opinion, find that. It's just great. But I have this kind of theory that in part, it's because John stops. I think so too. It's crazy to think about, but it it's relevant to this conversation to me, not just not because you've worked with them or anything, but because to me, like in the culture that we're in, if you say out loud, you say like, oh, the first time John like went out of that band for health reasons and everything, right? Mm -hmm. Came back in. But they do like that whole run of great records that you guys did like, you know, Californication and By the Way and Stadium Arcade and these things. But between that and now, like, it's like over 16 years. It's like 16 or 17 years between that and John playing with them again, you know? And in our culture and in our minds even, if you say the sentences out loud of like, who would quit playing with the Chili Peppers? Like, or like, who would give that up, right? Like most people would reflexively go no way right and yet to me i really feel like if they didn't it wouldn't be the same i don't think you could there's definitely to a feeling of everyone has a tremendous amount of gratitude that they have it now right and that might not have been the I, case if you had it all the time yeah you know when something is yeah. gone and comes back it's that much sweeter yeah, you, you treat it precious, but it's you also You don't take it for granted. Yeah. And it's funny, they play like them, but I also have to say, to me, I, I don't know if you've, uh, musically, developmentally, they're playing like jazz musicians on yeah. that record. Like they're, they're playing Chad too. I mean, t I mean, like- They're the best he's, musicians. He's playing- drum They're the best musicians and Anthony from the beginning till now has just continually gotten better and better and better. It's funny, I, I asked Anthony, I, I wrote Anthony about that song, White Braids, which you're never gonna hear on the radio, yeah, right? It's one of my favorite songs on the album. Yeah, it's, it's a gorgeous piece of writing. And, and John's not even playing, I mean, John's playing this beautiful, like Les Paul-like rhythm fill, you know what I mean? Just these, I mean, I sat there trying to work those chords out because they're, it's just this gorgeous. And I, and I asked him, I was like, I wrote him, I said, I think that's like one of the best songs you've ever written. And, um, and he said, you know, what's really weird is he said, I, the scene, he said, I saw the scene of that. I saw those two people in a cafe like 20 years ago and I wrote it down. Like he said, I've been sitting the image of this couple. Amazing. Um, which I love too, because I think like the, did you ever read, um, I think it's, I can't remember what, what it's in one of Rilke's the Austrian poet's letters, he says, he had that said like, to a real artist, 10 years is nothing, 
gestation is everything. I think about that a lot. I think like, but it's something that I really admire about. I don't even know John as well as I know Flea and Anthony, but, but I really admire that the courage to live a life and take a break from an identity. You know, it's really, really hard to do. Like, Absolutely. Let's listen to that song. So much, it's such a romantic song. There's like so much longing in it and dreaming of connection. You know, it's just it's just a great. It's it's a beauty. I really love it. But it, it's funny. I, you were in your book. You were. I like I like the idea you had that like there's. People are, making themselves antennas and conducting things down. They could come through different people, but they come through. It's it's really weird. Like I I, I think. There's lots of, I mean, I, I play guitar, not great, but I love guitar. I, lo I really love the instrument and I just, you know, I'm in music. I, and I love lots of bands and, you know, you identify or you relate to things, but there is this, I, there's such a funny thing. Like, like, and John, to me, John is like 
one of the all time, you know, I, for me, John sits in this really specific, like Hendrix and Prince and John, for me, they, they play the same way. There's a lightness of touch. There's a flickeriness to it, but it's really wild. The best way I can put it is like when I'm listening to this record, like I was listening to It's Only Natural when I was coming out here, sometimes the path of the notes that a certain person finds land in you and they're right. Yeah. You know, they're just right. Yeah. There's lots, there's lots of people I listen to and I'm like, they're great, that's great, whatever. I can't explain the level of satisfaction my brain gets out of like where John puts notes. Mm -hmm. They're like, to me, they're like perfect. And I kind of get that sensation you're talking about in the book where I'm just like, why am I, to, well, you know, so other, I'm, other people might not feel that. And it, it relates to the Mellows Brooklyn thing. I, I, I get really thrown off if I feel like a note or a, or a syncopation or something lands in the wrong way. Yeah. You know what I mean? A rhyme or a thing. Yeah. I think that is such a strange aspect of the brain that something in you is saying, like, it's not language, it's not logic, it's not anything, but your brain is saying that's in the right place. Yeah. Why? You know? Yeah. We don't know why, but you really can feel it. Yeah. And I think that's the key to all music. I've recently come to this, like, it really is just the timing, that the little timing between the notes, that's where all the energy lies. Yeah. The, the juxtaposition, the space. the space. The way these guys are laying this, it's also the way people lay space over each other. Like they make, someone makes space and someone else someone's is inside pushing, that space. Someone's pulling. Right. And on this group of tracks that I like, one of the things I love so much is it's, it's like this inversion because John's, Flea's playing a lot of melodic complexity around spaces John's making with some very simple rhythmic things. There's a big inversion going on of a lot of what you associate with like bass and guitar, you know? Mm -hmm. But I just find the whole, the way that, I have to be honest, like the older I get, the more I envy music as a form of expression. I, I like what I, you know, I, I like the yeah. things that I've, gotten to work on. I think also maybe because it's not work for you. Do you know what I mean? Like the fact that it isn't work. It's true. You get to enjoy it in a different way. Yes. And I, and look, I, I know musicians spend an enormous amount of time on the math to get to the place where it becomes not math, right? Because yeah. there's mathematics in music, there's patterns mm -hmm. and musicians can get very analytic and wonky also to create a thing that helps the rest of us get out into the non you know, the, the, the rhythm and the, and vibration stuff. But there is something really enviable too about the autonomy that's in music. Like I feel this with like Tom and Johnny and these guys, you know, I, I stopped in to see Tom and Johnny were, were in the studio at Abbey Road late and I went in and I was just watching them, you know, I was like, these guys have been just like Flea and Anthony, they've been together since high school, you know? And they're still sitting on the floor, on the parquet floor in Studio Two in, in Abbey Road, just playing, figuring, you know, playing, literally figuring shit out. And they don't have to get anybody's permission to do it. They don't have to get anybody's money to do it. They don't have to ask anybody to do anything. They can just go and do it. And there's a cataclysmic gulf between that freedom and the form that I've worked in more where the amount of headache, I mean, I love that I can sit down and write a thing, right? And if it, would, if it ended there, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. But the lack of autonomy, not just as an actor, like film in general. No, the, the number of people the involved, of people it's, involved. So, it's such a big production. It's so, it's so, it's an assault on your desire to have that kind of sacred space, right? Yeah. It doesn't facilitate, and in some cases, it doesn't even permit the creation of a sacred space. Mm -hmm. And I find that really enviable. And the longer I'm friends with people like, like, and Fleet, you know, we've been friends a long time. 
like he's a monk. I mean, he, and I, I, it's like, I envy the purity. I really envy the purity of the fact that like lots of times I pop across to his house and he's in the middle of a bass lesson. Yeah. A bass lesson. Yes. He still takes lessons. Yes. With his jazz teacher and he's practicing and practicing. You know, those guys have a devotional relationship. Tom expresses this too, that like, he can't think of it as content if he doesn't have a devotional relationship with it. You know, it, it and it keeps him Do you up think? in life. It's very hard to have. I'm going to be honest. It's yeah. hard to have a devotional relationship to keep a, a spiritual space in work that is as crowded as making films is. But I love the idea of that as a, that's a problem to solve. Like, don't think of it, it, it. Yes, it hasn't been that way. Yeah. But maybe there is a version of that and it could be really interesting. Maybe yeah. you can basically put together a, essentially a small theater group. Yeah. And film everything you do and have it be, and it could turn into some, there's some you can thing. Get there. You can get, yeah. There's yeah. a way to do it. There's a way to do it that approaches it. Burning Man's damn close. That was, that was like right up there with, for me. How quickly was that shot? Very quick. Like I think 28 days or something like that. Lots of rehearsal, yeah, yeah, yeah. which was wonderful. Yeah. And I'm not saying that, you know, Francis Coppola's line I love, like he said, the best things about making movies is that they're collaborative. And the worst thing is that they're collaborative. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like really true. But, but, and I think it's, I think it's also unfortunately true that the Hitchcock line that like, directing a film he said directing a film is to be pecked to death by a thousand pigeons <laughs> so true right it's just like the questions never end and the, the 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 left brain assault on the right brain is the intrinsic challenge in making movies but and there's just so much artifice it's also unfortunately and maybe this is why alejandro wanted to do when i read birdman he hadn't he didn't originally say, I'm gonna to try to create the single shot experience, right? Mm -hmm. I think whether he knew it or not, what he was trying to do was come as close to flow state in a filmmaking process as you can. And I, and I know, look, you, got, you guys are craftsmen, you're, you're stitching together a lot. You're, you know, I know it isn't pure flow state, it's not live. It's, it's a lot of craft. No, it's a combination. And a lot of stitch work. Yeah. Right? Yeah. A lot of stitch work. And yet, if you guys do a take and you're seeing a take, you're trying to find those things where the flow of the notes arrives at the right place, right? Mm -hmm. And that that's actually, when I talk about it, that's not dissimilar from doing takes on a film. Similar. And, it's like when it just locks in and yeah. comes together. And you say that was the one. That's the one. Yeah. Yeah, same. But and then you still might do something else to it after. It's true. Even as we're talking about it, I'm yeah, sort of even the really, score. I mean, think about it. Just putting the score in changes. Yeah. It. Oh, hugely, hugely. I'm never cease to be amazed by not just what music, but sound mix in general. Most films just don't work like at all until the sound mix is done. Mm -hmm. It's not even like it's not even fairy dust. It's literally like. It's like a piece of furniture that's gouged and you can see the bolts and the cracks and the everything. And until the sound mix is done, there's no, shell it's like shellac that goes over the whole thing and suddenly it looks beautiful yeah. and it works. And there's this whole sleight of hand, this, I, I can't even explain it, but it suddenly makes the whole thing cohere. I mean, I've been right up against the edge of going, oh my God, this just doesn't, this doesn't work at all. And when you do the sound mix, it suddenly, it's like, oh my God, it works like gangbusters, you know? Yeah. It's, it's wild how much the auditory experience of, of, of it can, can change. The story you told about the De Niro scene and being uh, taken out of the moment by what he was doing reminds me very much of the scene in Birdman where you're meeting Michael Keaton's character on the stage mm -hmm. and he's got all these ideas of how the performance is supposed to be. And you start, <laughs> your performance is so good that he doesn't even understand that it has started. <laughs> he thinks you're still talking to him right. when you're doing the scene. It, yeah. It was just like that. And he didn't even know what to do with it. Yeah. 
It was a great moment. Yeah, I, it's it's there's a lot in that that's multi layered and fun. Amazingly, that is the scene I was talking about. Yeah, where Alejandro said, "You guys are doing it like yeah. all wrong." <laughs> it's amazing. I'm not sure that what's in there. Yeah, isn't the very first take. one of those early ones. Yeah. If it isn't, it's yeah. the one we went away from it and came back to yeah. it. It's very disarming and watching that scene because it really we all have the same effect as Michael Keaton. We're in we're experiencing Michael Keaton, the, the yeah. viewers. Yeah. And when we come to realize it's already started, it's like, oh, this is what it's really oh, like. Yeah. Oh, when it, this is when it's good. Yeah, exactly. It's like <laughs> you don't even know it when it's good. I just I just think that and maybe maybe it's familiarity breeds contempt or you're always looking across, you know, whatever grass is greener. Mm. There's something in me though that some of it's the autonomy. I've always envied musicians and their autonomy to do their work in a in a room together and no one can they don't they don't need permission from anybody, right? It's harder to make films that way. You you just you, maybe I'm maybe I'm rationalizing it if I was I should be able to take my iPhone and go out and do whatever I want, right? But it's um it's just, it's the way of the world. But I actually think, I think what everybody's really chasing on some level is a feeling of, of flow state, you know, surfing, music, hanging, whatever. And maybe, maybe too, it's because I like going and hearing live music so much. And when I see live music where it's, you just go, what is, what could be better than that? Like, what could be better than to be, to have the facility with the, with an instrument, or your voice to be able to be ha having it flow through you and working it out as you're going. It's like, to me, it's just incredibly mm -hmm. enviable. Um, but I mean, I guess you've done it so long. It, it's, it's not like you can romanticize that it isn't struggle. Like it's like people, no, but you, people the, get the, in and they, the, when it happened, when something magical happens and it happens often, it's still shocking every time. You can't believe it when it's happening. Yeah. When when we were up in that other building and John Fashanti started playing guitar, first time I went back to see a rehearsal after John rejoined the band, I just started crying when they were playing together because it was such an emotional thing to see. It's so uh, tightly knit between them where it's like the psychic connection is so deep they move like they're one, you know, like an uh, half of an octopus. Yeah. <laughs> no, they just work together, yeah. it, it, perfectly together. And then when they're doing a, a take live, and I've heard the song in rehearsal many times, and then there's a dramatic thing that happens in one of the songs or in all of the songs often, and something happens where you can't believe you're in the room while this is happening. It's almost like they can't believe it's happening. Yeah. Or that they're not even there. They're, they're so there that they're not there. And it's remarkable. I had that experience also with uh, Carlos Santana. Mm. When he starts playing, it's like it's coming from somewhere else. It's some other thing. I don't know how to explain yeah. it. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I think Tom York told me that there's a track I love of theirs called There, There. It's the, it has that line, just because you feel it doesn't mean it's there. Like, you mm. know, and I think Tom told me that when he listened to it back, it was, he started, you know, he started to cry. Like, that it was like one of the, even though they were pretty far along in their career at that point, that he really like, it, it went beyond him. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that he was made emotional by it. Um it's funny because Anthony, you know, he's he's such a funk master and he writes these things. But but I I kind of think of my friends who are songwriters, like the thing I'm really knocked out by him is he's really like a um he's like a surrealist. I mean he really is like a, a linguistic surrealist. And it's that part same part of me that relates to the Turetic thing in Motherless Brooklyn, the wordplay, mm -hmm. the impulse to like if anybody plays with words more, I mean, I don't, who, who writes in a way that's wordplay more than Anthony? Like he, he stitches things together. He puts rhymes and concepts together that like, if you look at them, I mean, 
don't make any sense at all. Like literally it, you could write it and it's like, and I always know what it's getting at. Yeah, it paints a picture. It's so wild though. Like, yeah. What is what is that line? You know, there's a Carmen Ghia parked out back and we believe it's alive. Like, why am I moved by that? Yeah. Like that's that's really wild. You know what I mean? Like it that hits me in the heart because it's words that don't make sense, but you know that it's about a guy wanting to get in a car with a girl and drive. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that's amazing to me. I, I love how oblique, the ability to just put words together that are funky and that rhyme and everything, but that don't make literal sense. And have so much that feeling. That are so oblique yeah. and have yeah. that much longing or mm. juice, mojo, what, whatever the vibe of the song, it's a pretty wild thing to, to be that non-literal and always be able to communicate an emotional sensibility, you know? It, it shows you, it's like those things where, have you ever seen those things where um, they'll take a, a paragraph and every single word of the paragraph, they jumble the letters, but you look at the paragraph and you, you can, can read, read it, it out loud yeah. perfectly. Yeah. It, it's, it's something like that. Mm -hmm. It's like, you don't need the logic of it to, to get the essence of it. But that's another advantage I think that music has over images is the image shows you so much that it's hard to imagine your own version because you're looking at a version. Whereas if you if you're listening to a story, what you picture and I picture we'll picture different versions of that story. Yeah. But if we see the picture, we're looking at the same yeah. picture. Yeah. Yeah, in a way, it's why there have been some great music videos, but on the other hand, yeah, it, it, I don't, it can be just as limiting. Yeah, as, I don't have a lot of use for yeah. a lot of them. Tell me the craft of learning to act. What was that for you? When did it start? How did it work? It's hard to say. I mean, I saw, I saw, I saw my parents used to like to go to plays, and I, I, probably, I think I had a babysitter who was in a play. And I saw, I saw a play when I was like five and the whole thing seemed very magical to me. And it wasn't movies at first. I don't remember watching movies as a small kid, but I saw plays and I, I immediately wanted to be in that. I don't think it was more articulate than that. I just, I wanted to be a part of it. And I took, you know, I took, I started taking acting classes at a, t at a little community theatrical arts school, not at my school or anything, just this, this great little community. How old were you at the time? Five. At then? Yeah. You started taking lessons at five? Yeah. It's amazing. But I, but I did, a, you know, I, I, I played piano too, and I, yeah. and I, and I did soccer, and I did yeah, things. Yeah. It was not like, Understood. this is what I'm going to do yes, yes. at all. It was pure play. Yeah. Just play. Yeah. I just thought it was fun. I bounced around doing, you know, all my jumbled little life. It wasn't, it wasn't like a calling at that point. But I will say there was a lady who created our little community theatrical arts school who was completely legit. And when I, and I mean at the like Stella Adler, Lee Strasberg, that level of wow. seriousness, of intent yeah. to communicate what this is and that you take it seriously and that you, you, you got to learn the craft of it. And incredibly lucky that that incredibly, it, it's lucky. really interesting too. This is like in suburban Columbia, Maryland, like central, okay. Mar right? This lady, she came out of New York, moved with her husband, and she built a community theater arts program in a little nowheresville in central Maryland that lots of people flowered up and out of into Broadway careers, stuff like that. I mean, so cool. And that my recollection of it was it when you say a studio it was a studio yeah it was a place 
that the kids who were there were like, if you're here, you come, you come correct, right? Yeah. Like you, it's real. It's real. Yeah, it's wild. And then after that, when did you re-engage with it? I think a, a measure of seriousness about it notched up when I was like 16 or 17, and um, my public school just went for whatever reason went down and went to the National Theater in D.C. and, and Ian McKellen was doing this one man show, which when I think back on it, I'm like, why would they take a bunch of public school kids from outside Baltimore to see Ian McKellen in a one man show about acting Shakespeare? That's what it was called. And it was kind of about his life in theater. In a way it could have been right at home in this conversation. It was him kind of meditating on creative life and how in his case, Shakespeare's texts had opened up the gateway for him into sound like a great show life. It was what it was for me was, you know, you're a teenager and you're kind of, you're fantasizing a different, at least I was kind of like, ah, oh, it'd be great to be a pro, pro baseball player. Oh, it'd be great to be a, a spy. Oh, it'd be great to be, you know, whatever. Yeah. He made it seem like, oh, that's a, that's a life. Like that's, something you could actually do like it's not like oh there are people who are in movies but i'm here it was like no no this is a door and you can walk through it mm -hmm. you know and and i i definitely remember my wheels turning after seeing it and and going this is in the realm of the possible you know and maybe maybe something i should not let slip out of the mix, you know what I mean? But then when I'm, I went to college and I studied theater some, but I can't explain it. I had this, I had this kind of, um, part of it was I just didn't know who I was. I thought I wanted to study physics. I then I studied history and then I studied languages. And to be honest- Trying different things. To be, yeah, and to be honest, I disliked my school experience up through high school I was so emotionally unhappy that when I really luckily got to escape to college, and for me, it was a total reboot. Like no one knew me, tabula rasa. People seemed actually switched on about things. And suddenly I was like the kid in the candy store. I just, you know, I, I kind of wanted to sample everything. So I didn't have direct, I didn't have a sense of directional like thing. It was more just like, oh, I get to just be enthusiastic without, self-consciousness mm -hmm. and that was a real gift but i knew i wanted to go to new york just because new york had a i can't explain why new york was in my fantasy life it was like a place i wanted to and it was like i had the beastie boys in my thing you know there was that version of new york there was the like talking head cbgb version of new york there was the punk there was the hip-hop there was bruce springsteen for me, it was just an, an, a huge figure in my, in my desire to get out of where I was. Mm -hmm. And I, was, I grew up in that Route 95 corridor. You know, like some of his like tracks, like, like New York City Serenade and, you know, 10th Avenue Freeze Out. And these things, these, he, he painted this picture to me that I was like, I'm going, I'm, I'm going into that, right? Like, and, and then there was Scorsese's films and there was, I had this whole, New York just had everything to me. I really thought like, that's a place. And I still feel that, like I think it's changed a lot, but it has a density of collisions. Like, and when you're young, the, the thrill of being in New York to me was, you literally might go from one scenario to the other scenario in two or three blocks with five minutes of walking. And I loved the, the density of the collisions in New York was nuts. It was everything I wanted when I was that age. You know, I wanted, I wanted all of it. And I wanted to have a lot of unexpected encounters and, and everything. Um, but I, I went through this thing of going, um, I literally would still have these sort of flip eyes where I go like, I am going to go apply to the State Department and I'm going to go work for the CIA. I mean, I, I, I know it sounds really weird, but I... I wanted to live abroad. I had lived in Japan for a minute. When How I was that 19. 
just, I was studying Japanese and I was studying Aikido and like between two years in college, I, I just was like, I'm going there. And I, and how was that experience? Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Really exotic and great. Not like I lived in Osaka, a huge city, you know, but it was like, it was, it was so amazing. It, it was, uh, it was the first taste I had. It was the first window I had into the recognition that what's going on in America is not the be all and end all in other places, that the world's a lot bigger than, yeah. no matter how big we think American culture is, yes. sometimes it's really big. Yeah. And people do know, you know. No, but we tend shit. not to look outside. No, and, and, I, and I, it was like being, it was like going to another planet. I really felt like I was on another planet. There was, no one had any reference point that was familiar to me and I, and it was, that was healthy and good. But, um, did you ever read, this is a weird reference, but there's this really obscure essay called within the context of no context. Mm -mm. You ever read that? Mm -mm. George Tro, T R O W. It, it was kind of famous in among New York intelligentsia, kind of like the way they talk about Marshall McLuhan mm -hmm. and you know, the whole idea of the medium is the message and all that stuff. But, this guy basically, he wrote this, and it's funny because your book, I, I really like, I really enjoyed reading your book. It kind, your book's kind of reminded me too of um, Milan Kundera, the great Czech writer, his book, it's called The, the Book of Laughter and Forgetting. I've never read that. And it, it also is just like one page you turn and it's just got a paragraph this long on it and the next page is a full essay and the next page is, is a thing, it, it, it's beautiful. Um, but within the context of no context is kind of this meditation on the idea of like, does a thing have an intrinsic quality or is it, does what a thing is exist outside of the context that's around it, you know? And I thought about it when I was making Motherless Brooklyn even because I was thinking about that thing of like, do I want to set it in the modern times or do I want to set it in the fifties? Make it about this thing. He has this one line in that where he says, in America today, if I walk down the street wearing a fedora without irony, it would crush my head. And I really think there's something in that because we're not a homogenous culture anymore. We're not a white dominated, you know, we're now we're, we're becoming a true polyglot culture, but it does an interesting thing, which is it means that there isn't a context that we, you know, men wore fedora hats without thought because in the context of the time, That's a man wore did. a fedora hat, right. there was no commentary. There was no commentary in it, mm -hmm. right? Today, like your, your self-selection is an assertion of something, whether you mean it to be or not. And he was kind of, this was, it was way ahead of his time because he was, he was basically saying, we're heading toward a context of no context. Mm -hmm. And what is that gonna do to us? Mm -hmm. And I think some of the, all this, you know, there's a lot going on today about identity and in all forms. And I feel like he was meditating on that then. He was kind of saying, what happens when there's not a unifying context? There's a lot of liberation in that. And, Bowie was on that too, I feel like. I feel like he was way ahead. I think one of the reasons we were all obsessed with him was he kind of was like, I am completely outside of any context that you want to put around me, even rock, even yeah. even the, the 60s, rock, and no, nothing that you, nothing that you even think a rock star is, fuck you, like I'm, I'm an androgynous alien in a kabuki, you know, it's like, it's like, oh my God, oh my God, the liberation from him was a whole other order, you know? How did you decide to put the movie in the 50s instead of now? Why did you make that decision? Because it was two things. One was I really wanted a context in which the character with Tourette's is isolated because the context of the time is not sympathetic or evolved. I wanted a less evolved social context in which he's a freak and in which treating a person 
in the way that he needs to be treated to be isolated is not, you know, today we'd almost acknowledge that that's not the way you should treat someone. Mm -hmm. And I wanted his isolation to mirror the isolation of a young black woman in the 50s. I wanted there to be a theme of people who aren't seen for what they are. Mm -hmm. So that he's not, his condition makes him not seen for what he really is. She's a black woman and so she's not seen for what she is. And then I also think that Robert Moses was the, is the dark, he was, he, people thought he was the parks commissioner and he was a autocratic racist who ran the city, you know? And there's like danger in not seeing some things for what they are. So I, I, I just thought like, I thought you could. It solved a lot of issues yeah. by putting it in the fifties. Yeah. And also in the fifties was when the, in the US, in, in American cities, we baked in a lot of the discriminatory injustice that, you know, like we built the projects. I mean, we created things that became like poverty traps, you know, like social ghettos. I mean, we, we that happened in the 50s. Mm -hmm. Prosperous African-American and Jewish and Latino neighborhoods that were real middle-class neighborhoods got raised so that like Pratt housing could get built, you know? And, and it was intent, you know, and that, that kind of stuff was intentional. So it was also like a thing I think that was worth, that, that was kind of what I was interested in, but. So tell me about moving to New York. You know, I loved it. I loved New York. It was, you moved to the city in the mid eighties. I went to NYU, I think in 1981. Yeah. I think New York was probably even tougher in the eighties than in the, 90s oh for sure i mean it was like for sure there were still like a boarded up buildings yeah. everywhere and yeah i mean in the 90s i think it's you know brooklyn still had a lot of edge and mm -hmm. harlem still had a lot of edge like and but you know i don't know i don't know it's, it's impossible to say. new york probably still has a lot of edge if you're the a certain age mm -hmm. i i love that new york's a world city i i love that it's like did you move there though with a a mission like did you move mm -hmm. you just wanted to live in new york yeah i i figured i i, I felt like i was going to find the adventure that i wanted mm -hmm. and what were some of the adventures that you got into you know i worked for a thing my granddad had set up that was a housing development organization and it was great for me because i moved to new york and one of my early jobs was i went all over the five boroughs interviewing people who had like left a shelter and gotten into good affo affordable housing it, you know it was like we were making the case for how important access to affordable housing is right it was, it was that kind of thing and that's all great it was great work it was cool to the people who were doing that work i still kind of think of as very heroic people like i, I really admired them Still, and you must and, have met some really interesting yeah, people. Yeah, but that. it was really, but I, I was lucky. I, I, you know, I had my little Nikon camera and a, a little mini cassette recorder. And I, I would knock around, you know, to all over, you know, into mostly lower income neighborhoods and stuff. And I was interviewing people, taking their pictures and interviewing them. And I was, I was almost like a gopher, but, but I was, I was getting to see a lot of the city and encounter a lot of, of, of people. And then, you know, and I waited tables and I like, did, I mean, I had bizarre jobs. I mean, I like, I, I did I did so many, <laughs> I have this memory, I had a job, I, it wasn't even a job, I, I used to do a thing for extra dough because I could read fast. I found out that I couldn't type, but I had a girlfriend who worked, court stenographers take the transcripts of courts. Mm -hmm but it's in code. Mm -hmm. They take a tape deck and they read, they, this is the way it used to be, then they read it. Someone who can type sits with the tape and types it all out. And they got paid the best up here and then the typist got paid this. The, la the bottom of the thing was the proofreader. The law firms and the courts had to have court documents and depositions and court testimony proofread. 
So the bottom of the pecking order was you could go to these services and you could take as much as you could take. They would say it has to be back by X, right? But they paid 17 cents a page. And you could read fast. And I could, and I could read, I could read, you know, like a hundred pages an hour. Wow. Right. When, if I was, have you always just had that ability? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I could, I was good at reading and good at words and things, but it was also almost like a game because you were reading it, but you weren't sitting there and trying to absorb it. You were looking for errors. And a lot of it is like, Rick, did you ask her at that time if you could come? Edward, yes. Rick, and what did she say? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But there was format stuff that they wanted to catch. And here's the funny thing. In every batch that you could take and get paid 17 cents a page, they put 10 purposeful errors. To check you. They couldn't go through and check it. But if you missed more than three, so they would just take it, they would check the 10 planted errors. And if you missed more than three, you didn't get paid, right? right. So you had to be a little bit careful, yeah. right? I got, I got pretty good at it. And I used to like, this is my subway gig. I would sit on the subway and try to pick up 17 bucks an hour uh -huh. <laughs> by, by reading fast, right? But of course I was also doing my little downtown, I was moonlighting in play, I was doing my thing, I was doing acting classes, I was moonlighting in plays when I would get into them and I was staying up too late and I would be tired. So I have two memories. One was I fell asleep on the uptown like th three express at like midnight or one in the morning trying to pick up a few extra bucks to the things and I fell asleep and I woke up like in the South Bronx. <laughs> I woke up like and I looked around and I knew I was not like where I wanted to be at 2 a.m. And I like tried to jump off the train and the guy, and, you know, they shut the doors. And remember they would like, he caught my ankle. And then the guy was like nudging the train forward. And I was screaming. I was like, come on, come on, man. They, they let me out. And I was like, well, maybe this, you know. And then another time I was coming off an acting class in East 4th Street. And I knew I had this batch that was due. It was winter. And I was like, shit, if I don't turn this in, I'm, I think I got to go sit somewhere. And I was so fucking cheap at the time. I mean, I had like, I should have just gone and sat in the coffee shop or something, right? But I was like, I just have to find a quiet place, focus and get this done. And I poked into like one of those NYU buildings near Washington Square Park. And I kind of like went past this security guard. I was like, I'm just gonna find an empty classroom. I poke around and think classrooms are locked or there's things in them. I'm like shit, I go in this bathroom, there's this door and I'm like, open this door in this like NYU bathroom and there's a storage closet and it has like desks and like bathroom equipment. I'm like, great. And I'm so fucking nickel ante. I go into this storage closet off a bathroom at an NYU building and I sit down to like do my proofreading and I fall asleep, <laughs> fall asleep. And some janitor came and locked the door. And so I'm like, I wake up. I've missed my thing, whatever. It's nighttime. I'm, and you're locked in. I'm locked in a storage closet off a bathroom in an NYU like building. And I start literally like going, help, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, holy shit. I can't even get to the toilet. Like, I'm gonna, what am I, what's gonna happen to me? I'm like, I'm gonna have to spend the night here. Did so you? Think, and I'm like, how do I think? Suddenly I hear this, these keys. Great. This dude opens the door and he, this janitor, and he's just looking at me like, what are you doing, you know? Yeah. And, um, and I remember kind of having moments like that where I was like, ah, you feel like, man, this is like marginal, you know? <laughs> this is just, mar this, I'm, I'm, what am I doing? Like, I'm, I'm, you're like going by the seat of your pants and you're kind of like nothing. You're not, you're like, I'm not putting anything together here. Like, what am I doing? You know, the, and the, those are the times I'd be like, I gotta get, I gotta get out of New York. I gotta go, I gotta do something. I gotta get a job or I gotta do it. But every time I would contemplate what I was gonna do 
and I had ideas or something like that, then I, I kind of would be like, yeah, but I did get this audition for this play. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I would always land, like every time I got right at the cusp of like, fuck this, this is just crazy. Something good would happen. Something that was enough of a taste, mm -hmm. a re-injection of what I was loving about it. Mm -hmm. And I kept going along. I mean, I feel like, I mean, you were doing music even when you were at NYU. Mm -hmm. I remember in high school, the zines and the everything coming out of like, your all's early stuff. I, I mean, I remember like, the way Def Jam percolated to us. Mm -hmm. You know, we had, do you remember, we had one station called WHFS. It was the Mid-Atlantic alt-rock station. It was where Spike Jones and I are both from. And here's the weird thing. I made some money one summer and I started building my own BMX bike. And I used to cobble the parts together and I would save up to get the right kind of pedals or Shimano cranks or whatever. And Spike worked at, the only cool, it was like Rockville skate and BMX. Wow. And I used to go there. So cool. To get, and we're the same age, like he has, and he worked there as like a prodigy, like a kid. I think Spike has to have been at the place I used to go get my amazing. skateboard trucks and stuff, which was really wild. But anyway, WHFS yeah, yeah. was the only place they played like The Clash and Britpop and later, you know, R.E.M. Mm -hmm. and the Pixies and all of it. Alternative. Yeah, all the alternative stuff. So, and we didn't have any, there was no hip hop station right there in Baltimore, Washington. Same, same in New York. Yeah, there was no hip hop station. So WHFS was the only place mm -hmm. they put, you know, hip hop, any, you would get these little flickers of hip hop and then the Beastie Boys and stuff like that. But in my view, that's happening by like, Run DMC's like 86 or no, even earlier, like 80. When was the first Run DMC record? It's like maybe 84. Four, yeah. Like I'm um, in high school and um, we had this feeling that this thing was leaking down to us, you know, like this Springsteen kind of talks. Did you read his biography? Did, did you read his autobiography? I didn't read, but I saw the, uh, the Broadway show. Yes, which was amazing. Amazing. But in his book, he has a really beautiful kind of section about what it felt like to live in a small town uh -huh. and how the radio was be thing beaming, uh -huh. you know, from exotic places. And I really felt like the stuff you guys were doing, it was leaking to us through one channel, you know? I had the same experience growing up on Long Island and getting the music from, from New York. Like the Ramones or yeah. were they big for you? Biggest. The Ramones were? The Ramones were. I saw them play 50 times. Yeah. More. That's amazing. Was, were like the Talking Heads. Huge. They were CBGB, right? They, I mean, they were a big CBGB huge, band. Huge, huge, Who Who else in that time? Like, Devo. Devo. But also there was always that and then like Trouble Funk from DC or Run DMC. Mm-hmm. DC, we had, I was in the Baltimore DC, so we had like, you know, Minor Threat and mm -hmm. Fugazi were like our- Loved Minor Threat. That, that was like, they were pretty much the pinnacle of what yeah. was coming up and out of there, but there was that club, the 930 Club. Mm -hmm. I saw Radiohead there. At the 930 Club? Yeah. Holy shit, that's amazing. I actually remember, I didn't, I can't claim that I went and saw them there, but I remember the police played the 930 Club. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was, they were like the kind of band that was coming through, like Outlandos to More was coming through on that one alt rock station. Um, and the Smiths and, you know, were you getting involved enough in things that were lighting you up even while in college that you never had like a, this is marginal, I'm not putting anything together, I'm out of here moment? Like basically did it, did, no, the, did it ladder up? Did it ladder up for you successively, without you know from from literally like college straight through to when you guys were setting yeah, that up? I, I thought I was going to have a real job. I didn't think music was. I didn't do music thinking it was going to be my job. I did music because that's what I love to do, and luckily music took over before I ended up going to law school or right. doing something regular. 
did, did it just keep flowing and getting better and better such that you never had a moment of what I would call like, you know, existential. There was never an existential You, you didn't issue. have a, yeah, no. that's so lucky. It was unbelievable, unbelievable. I didn't even know it was a, a job. It just happened. Yeah. That, that's really lucky because I think it's wild. I mean, um, now that I have kids, their educational experience is so different from mine was. Like, I really hated mine. They love theirs. It's, and I'm happy about that. I'm, to me, I'm like great with, if they're joyful, great, right? Win, win, win. But, but what's really weird is for me, it wasn't good. And then getting to go to college was good, right? The more I look at American life, though, the more I think that in a lot of ways, I'm lucky. I'm lucky that I made it through to a point where, and I don't want to say non-straight world, like I wasn't comfortable in the straight world. And by that, I mean, like, I never even contemplated square, taking a job. World, right. I never even contemplated like taking a job at a bank or going to law school or anything. I just couldn't see myself mm -hmm. that way. But literally because of what I experienced in college and the degree to which the definitions of success were very informed by plugging into the next thing. As a result, I had existential, big existential doubt moments about pursuing a creative life. Mm -hmm. Big, right? And because my grandfather paid for me to go to college, I even had a thing of like, I have a responsibility oh, yeah. to think, thank God he was amazing and told me, no, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Like the arts are the best thing in the world. You know, he actually said, no, go, 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 go. You know, keep, keep going for it, right? In my case, if it wouldn't have happened the way it happened, I would have had a regular job that would have probably made me very unhappy, yet I would still be doing music as much as possible. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think Flea's book is really beautiful. You know, his chronicle of his young life is so beautiful in, in the sense that it's just, He's, he, he assesses it with such wisdom, you know, but I'm like, when I look at him and Anthony or when I look at Bruce or, or, or kids who are left to their own devices in a way that we wouldn't want for our kids uh -huh. necessarily, right? Uh -huh. Who have lives that have a lot of danger and a lot of uncertainty and a lot of instability and a lot of drugs and a lot, whatever you want to say. Like Flea, his chronicle is like, Music saved his life. Like music is the vector and it's the only way up and out. So there is, there's danger, but there's not necessarily an existential crisis because it's like, this is, this is the path. To, to me, it's a funny thing because, and I'm, I'm kind of wrestling with it now. Like it's almost like a veil. You have to deal with the fact that like, sometimes you think you've liberated yourself from certain things, but you still hold the DNA memory of a way you were taught to view the world. And I, almost going through this thing because it's a long way from my kids being at college, but I'm, I've almost come to this place where I'm like, I not only don't care if they go to college, I'm not sure I, w I even want them to, given, Same. given what I see going on. And I don't mean the modern fears about ultra left on the thing, none, none of that. More that I'm not sure that even what I went through doesn't hold within it more than I was even aware at the time, a value system that's hard to break away from. Oh, there's the Marlon Brando line in, um, with the, the female character is saying how, you know, how nice it is to be a little kid and to be free. And then he has the line about the indoctrination. Do you remember the line? I can't remember what it is. It looks like it's an ad lib. Is it in Last Tango in Paris? Yeah. yeah. Which, by the way, that, that talk about a movie that you understand better as you get older. Holy crap. He's, I mean, he, he's a super complicated, beautiful, tragic in many ways figure, I think. Um, the film that I was talking about having that experience with De Niro on was Marlon's last film. He, Marlon was in it. I, and I knew him before it. And uh, How did you know him before that? I knew him because someone who was a friend of his said to me that he had liked some of the stuff I'd done. 
and then kind of said to me, you know, you should go up and see him. And I was like, I, I don't, you know, I'm not going to present him. And he goes, no, this person said, no, you know, um, he needs people, you know. Uh, and, I, and what I started realizing is that there was, um, there was a period where I think, I think he was lonely. And I think that, I think that his, who he was almost in a weird way, put a cocoon around him. Like, I think there were people who got invited to kind of go and just bring him some stimulation and some, you know, youth and fresh conversation and stuff. And he, and I, that's how I met him, um, through, through this mutual friend. What was it like meeting him? It was great. Um, I feel looking back on it that I think Marlon was very guarded out of habit. The habit, no, not the habit, the long experience of, of too many people venerating him yeah. made him not tricky in a funny way, but he was a little coy. He, he would wait a bit to see what you were gonna be like, to see if you were gonna be gushy mm -hmm. or if you were just gonna, you know. Have a normal conversation. Yeah, talk shit with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was really funny. Yeah. He really liked jokes, he really liked things. So I think it was sort of like, I think if it got to, oh, Okay, you you know you're all right. Yeah, yeah. You're just you're just a pal. You're gonna give me shit. You're gonna mm -hmm. thing. Then you kind of met him, and and I found him. Um, he was you know he was he was old. I thought he was really funny. Um, he he was he was very very interested in other people. He was inquisitive. He you know wide ranging. Like you know you could tell he was like a. Uh, an autodidactic person. He like what it, what he had learned. He had learned himself, kind of, you know. And he and he was. Um, I don't know. Maybe I, maybe I, in a way, maybe I got lucky. And he he was um, in a time in his life when he was less. I know for sure there was stretches where Marlon was so contemptuous of the, the of the bullshit around him, and he was so contemptuous even of movies and contemptuous of. He had a very, he went through, definitely through periods of, of really disdaining his own talent, craft, the form itself. I think he had a pretty, I don't want to say tortured because that's not there, but, he, but I, I think he, he, he had real ebbs and flows in the measure of how much he respected even the form that he was known for and didn't want to talk about it and didn't want to think, Maybe I got to a point with him where he was comfortable enough, but I I would ask him certain things, and he and I found him really un. He was he was great. He I talked to him about his early days in theater, and he was very relaxed, um, and funny. He was really funny. You think it came from the fact that he was so deified that he felt like he wasn't he was never seen for who he was. For sure, I mean you've see, you, you've seen Scorsese's, uh, you know the big epic film on Dylan. No Direction Home, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I don't mean this in the wrong way, but it's actually one of my favorite things Scorsese did. And yeah. like, and that's I great. think that's such an important it's film amazing. because it's a portrait of a person becoming an artist, but then also at an incredibly young age having to defend the integrity of everything we've been talking about here against the onslaught. And, and I actually find myself pretty amazed you, you watch this 20 year old guy who has the density and the sense of self and the awareness before there were even pop stars or any of it. He's way, you know, you forget how few people had been made famous in that way, mm -hmm. like Frank Sinatra and like Brando or what Elvis. Yeah. But, but being told that you're the voice of a generation when you're 20 years old and having the presence to go, that's nothing I can relate to. Yeah. And, and refuse to unpack the work. I mean, that's like how many of us have ever refused to dissect yeah. the meaning when the ego stroke of the interview comes at you? You know, I mean, it's it's pretty unbelievable. What's cool about that Scorsese film, it's the first time you ever hear Dylan answer a question. Yeah. Because up until then, it's always just sarcasm and- Deflection, deflection, deflection. deflection. Here, no. It sounded like he was really honest there's one part in it where they're cutting between the interviews with him parrying with people there's a 
the, the fam, so he's at the table and the guy says, you know, what, what is the meaning of this, this? And he, go, he, goes, he goes, I don't know what it means. I wrote it, but that doesn't mean I don't know what it means. What do you think it means? Yeah. You know, and I'm like, who says that at 20? Like who, when, who, who in their 20 has people telling them, asking them to explain their stuff and saying that they're a generational voice and goes, don't saddle me with that shit, man. I can't relate to that. Yeah. To, you know, you figure it out. And then to your point, they go to him, I think he was in his 70s at the time, and, and, and saying, yeah, I was very interested in Woody Guthrie's idiom. I mean, he literally goes, I, I was pretty interested in Woody Guthrie's idiom and, uh, and, and, and I took what I saw going on around me and put it through that. But I wasn't gonna talk about it at the time. You know, I mean, it's literally, it was like, to your point, finally, it was like Dylan the craftsman. Yeah. Dylan the guy who created characters. Yeah. Dylan the guy who goes, yes, it was fucking constructed. Mm -hmm. Yes, I knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm but I wasn't gonna compromise it by unpacking it for you. Mm -hmm. I not only don't think many people, I actually think it's almost gotten worse. It's, I, it's not, I'm not trying to stick a finger at you know, colleagues or actors or anything, but lately I feel like you know, awards, which are so antithetical to art. Yeah. I mean, really the older I get, the more grotesque I think it actually is. Yeah. And I don't think people even realize how much they're being commodified. Their ego is being stroked as the mechanism for getting them to become a commodity mm -hmm. for a ratings thing and for ads being run, all this shit. It's an agenda. Mm -hmm. And when you realize that awards are an agenda, mm -hmm. they become, you're just like, this is doing such violence to the purity of work and the connection to people it's just horrible right yeah but pitting, the more so pitting creators against each other yeah it's it's the worst i don't think people realize how negative it is to the mission of having people experience what you've done to sit in your costume talking about how much you admire the director and them saying he's you're just like you're completely atomizing my chance to have a moment of willing suspension of disbelief and to have the magic trick of the whole thing Which work. Which is the whole game. And it's just like, why would you do that? And again, to see someone who even at 20 years old understood that if I let you behind the curtain, it's over. Like it's, it's over is really, really amazing. And I think that um, Brando, you have to really go back and and almost refresh yourself on the fact that when he did Streetcar Named Desire, he was 23 years old. And he woke up at 24 years old, being told he was the fulcrum between the old world and the modern age. I mean, literally, yeah. like Miles Davis, Marlon Brando, Pablo Picasso, mm -hmm. Bob Dylan, mm -hmm. like those people got treated as if they were the fulcrum between what came before and what came after. Mm -hmm. And if that happens to you when you're 24 and yeah, you're doing your thing, but I think it made him, I think it fundamentally broke his trust yeah. with humanity. Yeah. If you really get down to it, it broke his trust with people being rational and reasonable and it totally broke his trust that anybody was looking him in the face and seeing him. And For who he really was, who he actually exactly. was. Exactly, and that resentment, and so the, then the whole thing starts feeling fraudulent, mm -hmm. and that resentment starts to cook, and I think he, and I believe that he resented his authentic life being taken away from him. The, the opportunity for an authentic life, the opportunity for authentic interaction, for authentic experience. Yeah. And you know why else do you go buy a Tahitian island and? Yeah, I was and, just going to say and, and that's probably why he wanted to live in Tahiti. Yeah, and and, and where, where where people didn't care or whatever. I think that is pretty tragic. It's pretty tragic for a person that young in life to feel that their chance to wander in the world. He he said that he was like I, I used to want. He told me one time he was like you know I for all the world all I want to do is go dig ditches. I just just want to go to Italy and work on a road crew, you know, and and just have beers with guys after work, you know? And I think 
he never wore it comfortably because he never reconciled with it, right? You know, he never reconciled with what it, what I think he feels it, it ultimately took away from him. But Last Tango in Paris is pretty amazing because my, my theory on that film is it's the last time that he invested in the work and that, that I mean, I have, I have, I have, this could be a totally crackpot theory, but Marlon chewed gum in a lot of movies. If you, if you go watch it from Streetcar onward, Streetcar, he's chomping on a piece of gum the whole time. I know it sounds weird to say, but and in the world, in the context of the world at the time, that alone was sexual. Like it was oral, it was sexual. People didn't do that. It's not just that he's sweaty and in a t-shirt and he's got it on him. He's chewing on his gum. He's just visceral and present and things. And, and if you watch it, I think it was like, a, whether it was a conscious or unconscious, I think it's one of Marlon's tropes. He's chewing on gum a lot because it's grounding. It's relaxed. It's whatever. And in Last Tango, if you watch at the end when he's dying, he takes a piece of gum out of his mouth and he sticks it up under the railing of the balcony before, before he dies. Wow. And in my mind, yeah. he's done. And he never chewed gum in movies after that again? I mean, in Superman, you know, in yeah. whatever. Yeah, it's fascinating. But I think, my theory too is that Last Tango is just him. The varnish is gone. Most of what he says is about his own life yeah. in the movie. The thing that the, it's imp improvised and most of it's about him. Mm -hmm. Their story is from his real life. Mm -hmm. And I think that he essentially just, he lets himself be seen as a, as a person without any affect. And then, and he, and he wraps it up. And I don't, and I don't think after that, I think it's the last time he invested in communicating wow. really in, in the work. But also, by the way, when you watch that film, part of me goes, this is what we were talking about in the beginning. Part of me goes, he may have gotten to the point where he said, well, all that's really left is the lack of artifice in any form. Your diary, right? Last Tango is, is just diary from Marlon. It, it's mostly personal diary managed by Bertolucci or whatever. But, mm -hmm. and after that, what are you going to do? Go back to like fake teeth and a, uh, you know, a, a military costume or whatever. It's like, well, I get it. Yeah. I get in a way that he's sort of like, I, this has run its course. I, you know, I, I've done, I've done that. What else, what do you do after you've done that? Yeah. So it turns into the Vegas act instead of yeah. the, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or a paycheck or whatever. Yeah. And then, there's the feelings that come with doing a thing for the wrong reasons. And I think he had that too. Mm -hmm. Like kind of like, uh, you know, the shame, uh, almost a, yeah, yeah, yeah. a kind of shame. Yeah, like, like you didn't live up to your gift. Or I'm going to put it another way. I don't think it was that with him. I have a theory that in some ways there's a certain kind of shame that comes when you don't have the courage of your convictions. And I think his conviction was that he didn't want to do this anymore. And his conviction was that it, it wasn't worthy, that he wanted a different kind of life. But he still was doing it. But he went back for the money. Right. And I think- I see. And I think that there's a feeling, there's a feeling that comes with not sticking to your convictions once you have them. Yeah. But that's that thing we were talking about too, what John and, taking breaks, whatever. It takes a lot of courage to stop. Absolutely. It takes a lot of courage to stop doing a thing that you've done well and that you get a lot of regard for yeah. and get a lot of money for and choose the fullness or richness or diversity of your life and your, and a grounded human experience. And so I think like if you're Marlon and you, and you keep saying, oh, this is all bullshit and I don't care about any of it and everything, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do Superman. It feels like everything we're talking about today is the same story. It's all about you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it really is. It's amazing. Well, I think, um, yeah. It's, we keep coming back to the same story of that, uh, having the courage to step away and live. <laughs> yeah. But, but you know what? You know what? I think the reason Marlon, though, is an interesting 
on a meditator, in a way to me, and it's funny because he played Kurtz, right? In Apocalypse Now. Yeah. But to me, he is a little bit of a Kurtzian kind of a figure. Yeah. Because I don't want to feel that way. But also, not just, there's no reason to throw a thing you've done under the bus mm -hmm. when you know it has beauty in it and you know it can be done in a pure way and when you've had good experiences. Mm -hmm. And I don't think necessarily you even need to create false bright lines or declarations like, now maybe there comes a time some, I know one actor who said, I'm, I am retiring, like I'm, right. I'm done and told me that he declared it because declaring it would be a part of strengthening his commitment, right? Um, but in my case, it's not, I don't feel that, but I do think to me, like maybe Marlon's like the, the negative example, and we were talking about John and his breaks from the band, right? That's a positive example to me, because why? Because it refilled the tank or it, it brought around again to the place of desire and then it can be done again with love. And that's what you want. That, that's what you want, I, th I think, is like to be able to renew or resuscitate, yes. but from a different place as a different person and different observations, mm -hmm. right? Dif different things to bring to it, but it isn't, it isn't necessarily easy. But at the end of the day, it's like, it's like the ego. Like there's nothing but ego that makes you say, and maybe money, you know, I think it's also the excitement. Like I, I know if if I'm presented with a puzzle, because it's I always think of the work as sort of like solving a puzzle. Yeah. So this is a new puzzle that's presented, and thinking about it would be fun to figure out this puzzle, because every creative project is like a lot of things to figure out how to make them work. Yeah. So it's fun. You also have the benefit fit or the pleasure of facilitating helping other people get to their that's best true. expression. And that's, that's kind of amazing. You're doing a service for someone else every time you work with them, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. What's the longest you've ever gone without producing music? Never. It's amazing. Yeah, no, it, it's always happening. Do you have moments of aspiration to be free of even the, the puzzle solving or the, or the, do you have, do you have moments where you say, I could use a mental sabbatical from. I definitely have the feeling that you said earlier of like, why, why did I make the choices I made? Mm. But usually I have that feeling like in the morning, it's a beautiful day, it's sunny outside and I want to go for a walk on the beach and I know there's going to be a group of people waiting in the studio for me. Right. And I said, I was going to be there at right. noon. I have to be there at noon. So, and I don't want to go that, that feeling yeah. of when you commit to something, you have to show up and usually the commitments happen in advance. Right. So I commit myself in advance. And then when it comes time to actually show up, I don't want to show up. Right. Then when the puzzle is presented when I get there and we start figuring it out, it gets really fun and I love it. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't, and it doesn't always go well. Like it often, no. often doesn't go well. And that's interesting too. It's not as much fun. And I don't go home at the end of the day in as good of a mood when that happens, but it, it's just a matter of patience because I know it's not done until we do solve the puzzle. And I wish we would have solved it today, but we didn't. Mm. And it's okay. You know, yeah. we, we know now, at least we know these things don't work. Yeah. You know what we, we've, the solutions we've tried don't work. Do you get the feeling sometimes that, <laughs> I guess uh, one thing I feel sometimes it's that things take longer than you think they're going to take. Mm. It's true. And that thing we're talking about, about, you know, putting a commitment, a brick on the wall, a commitment, commencing something. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it could be, you know, building a house somewhere, you know what I mean? Yeah. But you, you, I think one of the negative dividends of getting some things done and they go well and they kind of reinforce your mind, oh, I, I've got capabilities to do more than one thing at once. And now I've got the resources. Now I got the help. So I'm going to commence different things. And at least in my case, sometimes I'm like, wow, 
I thought I could do multiple things at the same time and I can, but they now are obligations that are carrying on that have more durability than I thought they were going to. And it takes a longer time to unclip and liberate yourself back to simplicity. Mm -hmm. I, I don't feel old, but I think when I was even younger, I thought that I was going to get shit done faster than it turns out you can, you know, complete projects and stuff like that. And then, like you said, you, you've engaged other people in the, in collaborating on it. And then it's an obligation, mm -hmm. which is, which is challenging, but. I also like making other kind of things. You know, I started making some documentary projects and the book was a different thing mm -hmm. and it took a lot of time. So, um, sometimes I think it's more interesting to do something I haven't done before, but I'm also really, I love music you know, and yeah. can't, can't help myself. But it, I mean, uh, that, that, that takes me back to my kind of my mounting observation in life that a lot of my friends who work in music sustain that the passion for it is, is pretty, that it, that it's a, that it continues to yeah, nurture. It's, it is truly a devotional practice. Yeah, it and, really and, is. And I think a lot of my friends in music um, have maintained greater simplicity in life that like music's enough you know what i mean mm -hmm. and that's that's not to be reductive to say oh, people have family lives and they're complicated and you have your business these things but but sometimes i think like that impulse to do a diversity of things to exercise different muscles express different express yourself in totally different ways is really satisfying and some sometimes but that's that's where you can start to go like man i'm i'm, I'm spinning a lot of plates yeah you know, and then, and then you can start having the feeling of like, am I spinning any of the plates masterfully, <laughs> you know, like, or am I spinning any of the plates in a way that's enjoyable? You know, am I allowing myself to enjoy mm -hmm. one thing at a time, you know, to, to, to the full depth of like what it has to offer. But I also, I also think like there's some point at which you got to get to where you're like, you know, can see like the ways you're different from other people. You can be inspired by people, but if you're, if you're kind of like, you got to just get right with yourself the way you are mm -hmm. and go, you know, so-and-so's life is different from my life, whatever. They're all, we're different. We're different. We're all taking it on in different ways. We have to play our own hands. Yeah, we have to play our own hands. I'll ask this as it relates to theater because it'll be easier to think of, about because you do it the show night after night. Do you feel like when you're doing something every day, are you always either getting better or worse or does it ever plateau? I don't know if I'd say better or worse. Changing? Changing for sure. Um, more than you'd think this can apply in movies too but i think that i had to get my head around that is i think pulled from like music as an analogy is that like you want to believe that you're going to be able to find emotional connection every time and when there's an audience involved you have a different relationship. You feel the people have come to see you make that connection, right? You can be doing a play. You can even be doing a film and you can be on take 24 and going, I don't have it. I don't feel it. Mm -hmm. I'm hitting the notes, but I don't feel it. Mm -hmm. In a funny way, that's when an actor is a musician in the sense that like you're playing your 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 body's the instrument your voice is the instrument your emotional you, you're assaying this role is, is, is a thing you have to trust that you've done the work and that you are hitting the notes that it can connect for people because you've done the work it is connecting that you can't possibly feel it to the depth of your soul every night mm -hmm. whether you're an actor in month three 
of a really great play that some nights you weep in within the moment that you've done many, many, many times because it hits you, you've got it and you're right there inside it, accessing it. And the mo your emotion is even authentic and they're feeling it too. But then on the night that you're playing the score and your head's a little over here, it's still, it's okay. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's not a cause for panic and it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean it wasn't good. It doesn't mean you didn't deliver. It didn't, doesn't mean whatever. I mean, our friends that we've been talking about, like I, I, I saw, you know, the guys on, on this tour, I mean, they've been touring for, for fucking two years practically now. I've seen it a bunch of times. I saw them in 19, I wanna say I saw them in a bar in New Haven called Toads. Remember Toads? Yeah, I think my punk rock band played at Toads once. Yeah, I think I saw, uh, like when um, Mother's Milk came out, when John joined the band and Mother's Milk came out, I saw them somewhere like that right after that, because John and I are the same age, so I was like 19, he was 19, you know? And I feel like, like if you've seen people play a lot, you can kind of tell just like, oh, he's, he's like in the zone, like a basketball player or whatever, you could be like, oh, they look tired tonight, you know what I mean? Yeah. Nobody says they don't like deliver in their show, like their show kills, you know? You know Charlie Parker had his head off in something else on nights when his virtuosity, people were like, they were melting, yeah. you know? But you gotta, you gotta like be okay with that, I think. You also have to remember that the audience that comes to see you doesn't get to watch the show every night and doesn't get to compare your performance. No. They just see one. Yeah. And the one they see is the one they remember. And also the, the yeah, for you, it's, it's like a little bit of a Zen stroke and like this curve might not be as perfect as you did it last but night. But to them, that's the picture. And also what you're doing is the totality of what you've been doing. It's, yes. not, it's not your perfect connection to it on a given night. And it's funny because that, that's, that's a pretty unique thing to the performance arts. You know what I mean? There's not a lot of analogies that I can think of where, like if you phone it in in soccer, you're gonna lose. You know what I mean? Like when you're trying to create magic yeah. in the live setting, yeah. you just can't do that professionally and not allow yourself to rest on on the muscles you've built sometimes and and be okay you know and, yeah and you're also you're representing yourself in this moment so sometimes maybe if the performance to you is less good it's still authentic in where you are in that moment and it's real well that's really interesting too because more than a musician, an actor has a text that they got to stick with, mm -hmm. right? For me, one of the things, it's a real nuance, but I grew up a little bit in certain plays that I did when I realized that what you just said is true. It's not even that I have to, I may not feel it, but I have to be okay with hitting the notes. Mm -hmm. It's actually a little further. It's, it can change based on where I am. Tonight, I can be within the same text. Yeah. I can be a little colder and the play is that tonight. Yeah. It's not that I have to hit the same notes, but, but be faking it a little yeah. or phoning it in. It's actually, I can channel where I am. I can keep it authentic by let, within reason keeping. And it sounds can, like that also would inspire the people you're playing against they're going to change based on your yeah, change. It's yeah. like and everything th changes. That's right. Then you're in together. a dynamic. Yeah. And, and that's where it is like a band. But that makes it more like yeah. improvisational and more yeah. keeping it real. And it gets back to that challenge of just being available to what's actually happening. Actually, you know, someone who's, um, it's a weird thing to say, but uh, someone who I is, is very committed to that is yeah. Bill Murray. Mm. I've only, I've only done Wes Anderson films with Bill mm -hmm. and hung out with him a little in life and everything. But I'm, you know, and it's not that Bill's not super appreciated as a really great actor in addition to being 
Bill and being funny and everything, but he's he is extremely serious about his commitment to being available to what's actually happening wow. in the work and in life. Mm. And sometimes he, it almost seems like he's being provocative, mm. but I think that he, among people I've met kind of in my trade, whatever, he, he really wants to just respond to the moment. And I've seen him in life in some ways that were a little unnerving, in some ways that were really funny, some ways that were kind of heartwarming. I've seen him kind of not be happy when he sees a disconnect. A disconnect. Yeah. And he'll stick a fork in. Make it real. Uh, go, you know, kind of the snapping yeah, of the yeah, fingers yeah, yeah. in the work. It's really cool. So Bill is in the moment. Anyone else you can think of that has that kind of in the moment feeling? Yeah, I mean, you realize people come at things in just very different ways, even within what looks like the same thing. I'm sure musicians are the same, you know, it's like mm -hmm. there's people who are highly improvisational and fluid and some who, for whom preparation and like really conscientious sculpting and crafting and sticking to that is matters more to them or is that that's their mojo you know would you say you're more in the second school i think it depends on the gear i'm in if i'm just acting in something it's a more pleasant experience to to have wide latitude to discover and flow and everything but i think actors have to be in the best scenarios, you you are there in service. You can be a primary collaborator in creating a thing. It, the chemistry of every single thing is different, just like it is, I keep saying music, but sometimes you got one person who's really the band, you know, they write the songs and the things and there's people who are brilliant, but they're the, they're the leader. And sometimes it's totally different. It's mm -hmm. like, thing, and there's it's no the same. Right way. Every single film, every single project is a different mm -hmm. chemistry of relationship and collaboration. But I think as an actor, you have to be prepared and enthusiastic to step into and service the vision that a director has, the frequency that they're trying to establish. And even it sounds like a, a, a the style, you know, like if you, if you're gonna make a movie with Wes Anderson and you try to come to it in the same gear that you're in, it's just not gonna work. Like you you must know, love, appreciate, and be conversant with Wes's language, not just Because it's style not like anything things. else. You're there to service, you're yes. there to play yes. a, a role in his company. Yes. And and what a what a pleasure, you know, what a what a delight. It's a, a thing. I think when I'm when I'm directing, I would like to do something that allows for more improvisation and fluidity and discovery as a storyteller, as a director, um, the things I've done, it's really weird, like uh, not really weird, but when you shoot in New York, <laughs> like shooting Mothers Brooklyn, I had, I had so much less time than I should, I don't say should, you, do, you work with what you got, but there was no way to make a big period 1950s film in modern New York City in the schedule that I had without a nearly maniacal amount of preparation. The fun was that I was able to go to almost exclusively New York actors that I've worked with and know and were all from my orbit and say, I need everybody here like a play we can rehearse. I need everybody to be tight, to be ready I'm not gonna be able to do a lot. We're gonna to have to move pretty quick. And I only involved people that I thought would deliver and happily, you know, who was in there. Yeah. It, 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 they were, they're all Arabian horses, all thoroughbreds, mm -hmm. theater trained, mm -hmm. theater experienced, able to come and know that they're helping me. 
by bringing the goods mm -hmm. ready and fast, you know? And they did, and it was great. Did it mean that with some of my favorite actors I was able to play? No, I, w I wasn't. I understood. I wasn't, but, uh, but you gotta work in the, you, you gotta play with the, like you said, the cards you're given, you know what I mean? How different would your performance be depending on the person you're performing against? I mean, I, I guess it can be really, yeah, I mean, it can be hugely affected. Have you ever done a play where the character that you play against changed? Like the person playing the character changed over the course of the play? No, I haven't, ha I haven't ever had that. And I'm curious to how different oh, that, that would be. be. Yeah, that would be. I think be strange because kind of you strange, build a rhythm with the person, right? Like if the person is a more energetic mm -hmm. or talks faster, I that just saw something. You? I just saw. You know who Ossie Davis was? Mm -hmm. uh, great writer and actor and director. Uh, I did. I did a film and got to be friendly with um, Leslie Odom, who, you know, he 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 played Aaron Burr in Hamilton. He he, you know, brilliant singer, brilliant actor and um he's got this revival up in new york right now of uh of this play otzi davis wrote in the 60s and i i was completely blown away by it it made me i don't know if i was in a headspace of going god new york theater how antiquated you know i might have i i kind of walked in maybe i just was in this mood of like hadn't been back in new york in a while and i was like you know god like what is theater? Like, what is this? Like, how many people is this for? Is this work anymore? Does it, you know, I had a lot of that going on mm -hmm. in my head and I walked out of there going, that's why theater exists. Like that is why it that's exists the best. because it couldn't have been anything else. And it was so heightened and so delightful and satirical and great. But I also really, Leslie and this actress, Carrie Young, they were performing in a gear. I don't, I don't know how to describe it. It was so, it was so, op, it was so boldly operatic, comedic, almost like Commedia dell'arte. It was like something you would expect like Moliere or you know, like those great John Patrick Shanley plays that were big and operatic. I, and she was doing things physically that I was sitting there, I was, as an actor, I was sitting there and going, what would bring you to that choice? I was gobsmacked. I was like, I can't even wrap my head around where you got the indication that that's where you should go because it was so whacked and it but it worked unbelievable wow unbelievable i don't i didn't even know how to describe it i was just like afterwards i i was literally doing you know the we're not worthy kind of like yeah thing to them both because it was so theatrical it was the definition of like like real theatrical art like it was it was it was floating way up above reality. You know, it, it wasn't behavioral naturalism. It wasn't moving insight. It was, it was like, it was just this totally elevated thing. And it's great. You know? Sounds great. Yeah, it's, it's funny in a way that, that like when a lot of the best things in any form, it feels to me, are things that shouldn't work. And it's like, the force of talent is hauling it down. I felt that way about Hamilton, honestly. Mm -hmm. I'm not a musical theater aficionado or a huge fan. You know, I don't say I'm not a fan, but it's a, it hasn't generally been my bag, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I saw that a couple of times and I, I actually got emotional a few times watching it. I, was, I got emotional over the audacity of the whole thing. Yeah, I imagined him walking around in the Bronx with his headphones on and his pad, right? Having the balls and the conviction that he could write something of that magnitude. Yeah. 
I had that feeling about Hamilton and I had that feeling about Book of Mormon. When I heard about them, you're like, that sounds like the worst idea ever. Yeah. The worst. Yeah. And then they were mind blowing both. Yeah. I, Masterpieces. I, I, I agree. I, I, b- both of those, I totally like agree. Like on paper. Yeah. Bad ideas. Bad idea. But, but there was something about the scale of the creative audacity of Hamilton actually made me cry. Yeah. Like I, I, I was just so blown away at the size of the swing. And also just the magnitude of it. It was like, it is like, like a huge double album or something. It, it's the scale of it is just like incredible. The density of it. Mm-hmm. And it's always something like that. That is what transports you. Like you're, did you see the movie Triangle of Sadness? Mm-hmm. It, that I, I had the Swedish filmmaker who I think has made some of the best modern films. Triangle of Sadness was like, it, it functions like a dream. Like if I said to you, oh my God, I had the most whacked out dream. I dreamed that my girlfriend and I were arguing about the check at dinner and who was gonna pay. And it got so heated that we were fighting in an elevator over it. And then we were on a yacht and, there, and Woody Harrelson was the captain, but there was Russians there and they made the crew swim and then there were pirates. And then we were surviving on a beach, but the toilet attendant became the queen. That's how it works. Like it's, it's, it functions like a surreal wow. dream. And, and again, it's almost like knowing when you know something about making movies, you're almost more impressed. Yeah. Because you know how hard it is. Nothing about it's supposed to work. To break out yeah. of like, I saw some interview with Freddie Mercury about Bohemian Rhapsody or whatever, you know, and it's just like, it shouldn't work, right? Yeah. Like there's no bridge, there's no nothing. There's these things, none of the things that are the way you do a song. Yeah. And, and now we can't live without it. You know what I mean? It's just like- Those are the revolutionary works, the ones yeah. that don't fit any, they don't check any of the normal boxes when they work. It's the most fun thing to see. Yeah, because you you got shown something, you know. Um, I, I don't know if you feel this way. I think the people I know in music really do have like a, a re, you know, kind of a, a religious relationship with music. And I think because music's not, because it's so primal, because it's vibrations and because people get so affected by it, it's like sacrosanct. I don't think the culture even, nobody questions that we need music, you know? I definitely do go through things where I just sort of go, I know art has value. I know it helps people. Like I think Joseph Campbell's really right that if it's opaque, it tends to be more narcissistic. If it's transparent and a person can see through it and say, oh, that's really about me that's when it's mythological, you know? And I do agree with that. Like it it makes people feel not alone or it makes people perceive the universe differently and that that, that there's some value in that. But I definitely will go through some things where sometimes I'm thinking like the productization and commodification of content will sometimes, like my cynicism, it's like, it's like an opposing force. It is like an opposing force. And I, I love films, but I literally, like I do get to a place sometimes where I'm like, are we making opium? Are we just making opium and giving people like something to check out in front of for a minute, you know, a palliative against like the stress of modern life? The answer is with Birdman, no. I hope so. I hope that's right. As an example. I hope that's right. I, you know, I, I, I there clearly are examples the other way. Yeah. Yeah. In many, music too. Many. And photography and everything like, yeah. but being lucky enough to know some people who I think have done like incredibly heroic and important work that's like in direct service of other people. Sometimes my brain goes, You've done enough of this. You know what I mean? 
I, I, I'll get to this place where it's just be like, or, or even, I know this, you, you won't agree, but sometimes I'm like, there are voices that are coming into the mix that need to be heard, mm-hmm. like literally more than mine. Mm-hmm. Like I, 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 and, I, and I just go, I've done, you know, I've done this enough. Like I've done this enough. And There's room for everybody though. <laughs> there, I know, I know, I know. It, it, it's, it's true. It's not like a... Um, it's not a zero-sum game. No, it's, it's not a zero-sum game, but, um, but I, I have my ebbs and flows to just like, uh, what does the world actually need? Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and, but I, it, it's probably overthinking it, you know? Yeah, your part <laughs> isn't what the world needs. It's what's your diary entry. Y- yeah. It's yeah. what's your part. That's all. Yeah. I guess the, the other thing is it's, um, like we know people who work in tech and things like that too, right? everybody goes through the thing where you think you're like, you think you're painting the future or something, you know? And like, we're definitely, the truth is that the, not even the long-term future, the immediate future is so unknown mm-hmm. and so unpredictable. Mm-hmm. Like you can say, I, I engage with what I think is like, you know, um, the the, I think that the issue of like what we're doing to the, environment of our planet is is important right because it, it is going to affect people and intrinsically i think it's important it, when you take a breath and you step back and you just realize like you can throw yourself against ideas of of how you can contribute and what needs to be done and everything and you have to acknowledge that like in six months something can happen that that makes everything move. You know what I mean? And then when you acknowledge how small your life is within this massive uncertainty about what are going to be the emergent phenomenon that actually define what things look like in the future, you come back to the place of saying, well, in that case, hopefully it's not selfish to say, then I ought to think about just the existential quality of the way I'm spending my time, Mm -hmm. which gets back to like being present, being available, allowing yourself simple pleasures of just existing. And in any day that you've got the blessing that you're healthy, you're not being bombed, you know, you're like, don't squander it, you know? Do you feel like there's a spiritual dimension to your work? At times I have, and, and I guess what I, when I'd say spiritual, I don't, I don't necessarily mean divine, but I think that there's actual gift of service. If you're trying to connect people to each other, like there's that thing we were saying about it, when we we're talking about empathy, if the work's got empathy, and you know that through it, you're reaching out to other people to say, we're in this together and you can see yourself in this, we're talking to each other, then, then yeah, it, 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 and it's really interesting because people, you know, people can be absolutely ridiculous and disconnected in the way they come up to you because they know you. But when people come up, kids, or when, when anybody comes up who's present and isn't going, like I'm, th- I'm so excited because you're, I know you or something. When people are coming up with presence and connection and saying, man, that connected for me, how can you be in any way cynical about Greatest that? Greatest feeling in the world. You cannot be cynical about people affirming back to you that they felt seen, they connected, they felt open, you know, it's the best. Best. Then you go, okay, this is as worthy as anything else. Yeah, I mean, when we were when we were working on Fight Club, it's it's very reverent. We were laughing our asses off. It was very. There's no question in my mind that sitting in the room yeah. was the awareness that this is for us and our friends. Our parents will not understand this. Yeah, they won't. They probably won't like it. 
Yes. They won't relate to it. Yes. They won't it's get ours. the lingua franca of it. This is ours. Yes. And we better go for it. It's the best feeling. We better go for it. Yeah. Because we've got in our hands the vehicle to remember what it felt like to be in a certain place at a certain time for a certain group of people. Mm -hmm. And that and that was that was an interesting experience too, because it was one of my first experiences of feeling that sensation that strongly. Mm -hmm. And then the the commodification, what it didn't go well at all. You know what I mean? Like that movie was a, a, like a flop in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And Fincher was, I think, felt very bruised. And I remember we showed it in uh, uh, the Venice Film Festival and Brad came up to me right before we walked into the big red carpet stupidity and all that stuff. He said, how do you think this is gonna go? And I said, I don't think it's gonna go well. And he said, he said, me neither, let's get high. Right, and he, of course, because he came in on a private plane, he had like a joint like the size of a of a large cucumber, and he's a pothead. I wasn't. We smoked this joint, walk into the Venice thing. I like felt like someone was carrying me by my ears, three feet off the ground the whole time, but it was great because we. I sat. He and I watched it. My my recollection is that we saw Scorsese walk out, which was also kind of like perfect like you know it's like and then it was booed yeah right it got booed right uh. and it was there were boos and we were in the last row in the back and brad turned and looked at me and goes that's the best movie we're ever going to be in and i said me too and we were like hugging wow, each other how cool is that yeah it was like it was like he we were teary-eyed that's real and he and he he said that's the best movie we're ever going to be in Unbelievable. and, um, and while well, people were booing yeah and 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 he meant and it. Was it. Funny it wasn't a joke. Now I, I want to be careful. Like I, I maybe it's maybe I was stoned and I don't. Remember. I think my recollection is that Scorsese walked out of it because I also think I remember that hitting Fincher in a way. But this is all a little hazy, to be honest, or very hazy. But there's. But I hope, in a weird way, that I am remembering that right because Fincher had a thing on the office wall when we were rehearsing. And it, it said like, on the path to enlightenment, you you have to kill God, kill your parents, and then kill your teacher, right? And I remember thinking like, Scorsese, if Scorsese walked out, we did it. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> like, we, like we killed our teacher, you know, like fuck the critics, but if we feel good, even if our hero walked out, then we're in good place. That's an incredible story. <laughs> Thank you for telling me that story, I love that. Yes, yeah, it's it funny. And then it, you know, then, but then it was to your point. It's like, it finds its way. Yeah. It's just, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you can't, you. No. Yeah, and, and in a weird way, like with that one, what could be more true to everything it's trying to say Yeah. for it not to do well? Yes. And then be something you'd never trade. Like you'd never trade what that, one, how that one went into everyone in our friends that we made it for it. You'd never trade it for, you wouldn't trade it for a billion dollars. No. It'd be a sign of defeat if it was. But to know it in the moment, when, while the people are booing, yeah. to hug each other and know <laughs> this is great. <laughs> That's really bold. I love it. Yeah, it was, yeah. There's something too where you just like, you know, like when you're showing, they should have never shown that movie in Italy with subtitles. It's like that should have, you know, yeah. they shouldn't have showed, they should have showed that. I don't even know what. It should have been at like, it should have been in a college auditorium, you know, yeah. with free tickets for everybody. Like, yeah. no pretension, no, yeah. no nothing. Yeah. Like, do you miss um, life in this, like the cities of your youth? Not in the you least. Don't. Do you think you zero? Knew, do, you, do I think I know that about you? But do you think you knew? When do you think you realized that you were ready for a a big fundamental shift of scene from the energy that catapulted you into the kind of work you wanted to do? Like you didn't take a break from work, but when did you just go? I got to do this a different way. Yeah, I never knew until it happened. It's so like I came to California to work on a project. I hated California. I loved New York. Came to California to work on a project. Was here for like nine months. 
I ended up buying a house because I was tired of staying in a hotel. And I thought, well, when I come from New York, I'll have a house to stay in. And I just ended up never going back and grew to love it. And then the next time I went back to New York, I was remember feeling like, I can't remember what it was that was keeping me here. Mm. You know, I didn't know. And the same thing happened when I moved from in town to Malibu. Mm -hmm. At first, when I got a house in Malibu, I thought, oh, that's really far away. And then when I moved here, it was like, far away from what? Yeah, and, <laughs> you know, it's no, like no, nothing also, I want to yeah, go to like, is anywhere like, but here. I know. I had a similar, because as an East Coaster, yeah. Baltimore, and then New York, and yeah. like I had a total prejudice against LA in particular. Mm -hmm. And I would come out here and work and get out of here as fast as I could. Mm -hmm. And I totally missed the whole trick. I like thought LA was like West Hollywood and, yeah, uh, you know, and, and everything that's truly great about the state is like the space and the light and the, the ocean and the, yeah. you know, the, the mountains and the yeah, snow the right the, next yeah, to each yeah, other. Yeah. Yeah. And the desert and, and, um, and, it, but it embarrassingly, it took a while f f for me to like perceive what was, you know, get out of the matrix in a way and perceive. No, cause we were indoctrinated. Yeah. <laughs> we were. But, um, I was in New York snotty about being like a New York theater actor and going, doing thing. And, and there was always that line, like, um, it was like, I think it was a Neil Simon thing. Someone told, said to him, like, why don't you, you know, they're making all your plays in the movies. Why don't you come to LA? You know, it's like when it, the weather's just so much better and everything. And supposedly he said, yeah, when it's, when it's 30 below in New York, it's 76 in LA. And when it's 110 in New York, it's 70 76 in LA, yeah. but there's a million interesting people in New York and 70 in LA. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. And you know, but it's just not true. No. It it, it, what, what it is, is there's good and bad people everywhere. Yeah. And you just got to find your people. It was, um, yeah, I think that's right. It, there, for me, it was partly because coming out here meant working in the movies and because LA it's very diverse, but it feels like an industry town. Mm -hmm. If you're in the industry, it is, it is an it, industry, it's an town. industry town. I think it is. And it, and in a way it's seeking to enfold you within its hierarchies. Yeah. Right. It wants to define you within its hierarchies. And if you're resistant to that, then you just want to get the fuck out of here. 